Good evening. I'm going to call to order the March 13, 2017 meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. We are here tonight for a public hearing on a number of zoning bylaw uh, amendments to be proposed before the town meeting. First up is Article 6, uh, Zoning Bylaw Amendment for the Mixed Use in Business and Industrial Zones. Uh, to see if the town will vote to amend the Zoning Bylaw, Article 6, Section 6, Table of Conventional and Density Regulations for mixed use development by reducing or removing the minimum lot area per dwelling unit square foot requirement or take any action there related thereto. Uh, I will turn it over to Laura Wiener to present that. Article. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we now have about eight months of experience working with the mixed use bylaw that was passed at last year's town meeting um, to allow us to do <coughs> mixed use in commercial corridors. And um, we've had two projects come in front of the board um, with the possibility of a third one who we've been talking to the proponent, but it's not yet ready. Um, and the feedback we've gotten from the, de the, um, the developers of these two projects is that the dimensional regulations are pretty restrictive, even, even with the um, slight loosening up that we passed last year. One of the problems that has been identified is the lot area per dwelling unit. This requirement determines the number of units allowed on the lot, and we did not change it from what was allowed before in a residential, in a, in a um, residential property. The current requirements range between 600 to 2,600 square feet of lot area per dwelling unit. The effect of this is to create fewer larger units in each building. Eliminating this requirement would result in a variety of unit, unit sizes rather than all larger units. Mixed use in commercial zones is particularly favorable for empty nesters and older residents because of the proximity to public transportation and services who don't necessarily need large units. It's important to note that removing this requirement would not allow taller or larger buildings, but just more units within the building. Um, a look at some other communities found that many have no requirement for lot area per dwelling unit. The communities I looked at that um, were, uh, did not have uh, that requirement were Watertown, Somerville, Brookline, and Lexington. I'd recommend that we eliminate that requirement for mixed use in business zones to allow a mix of unit sizes within mixed use buildings. Questions from the board? Okay. Not, I'm generally supportive of this. I think this uh, allows uh, developers in mixed use uh, areas to uh, put a few more extra units in which allow for more affordable units. We don't need such large units. I think that is quite helpful. Uh, having in, an increased density in, uh, in these projects would give it a good mix. And I think um, the market will determine, you know, what the exact size will be uh, suitable, so that uh, yeah, people nowadays are seen to be living smaller, living more efficiently. Um, I think that might, this is a good way of uh, encouraging that. And I would support this. Laura, have you had? Well, I think you said you have had conversations with developers who have moved forward on projects. Mm -hmm. that Sort of removed. Um, I think that the, yeah, yeah. the developers that we spoke that have come through would have preferred to do more units, some small, some large, okay. as they, instead of having to do a <coughs> large unit. So we could have, in, in the end, gotten more. Good. David, um, I'd just like to echo um, that uh, I think we need more flexibility. Uh, in, in the mixed use developments to provide uh, more me. variety. Could, could the members speak so that the audience can hear them, please? Sure. Thank you. I, I use my big room voice. The um, big room is very empty. <laughs> uh, I, I just wanted to reiterate uh, what, what Ken said, and as Laura also mentioned, uh, that uh, I think it's important to give developers in the mixed use setting more flexibility with unit sizes uh, so that we can uh, provide more housing uh, in a situation where we've specifically uh, intended for a greater density of housing 
uh, with uh, uh, commercial in, in the same building. So I, I'm generally supportive of this. Andy. Is it, Laura, is there any downside? Is it, is it start to get to be a problem if the developments get so big that you get a lot of small units? Because I don't see any downside to this. I think the flexibility is right. Um, have, did you analyze a, a case where it, it would be a problem or not? Uh, I think, you know, if we weren't to do some kind of transportation demand management, we could end up with more cars because each unit would probably have a car. But I think so far, all of the developments that have come in have wanted to do transportation demand management and reduce the total parking. Which so, I think that fits with the idea of having flexibility right. and uh, also following the market. So I, I just would agree with Kim and uh, Dave. And they've all been right on the bus lines. Although the one on Summer Street is on one bus line as opposed to the one that's on Mass Ave and Broadway have the more slightly better access. Dean? Nothing to add. Okay. I'll open it up to members of the public for questions. Please raise your hand. I'll call on you one by one. Uh, stand up. State your name and address for the record. Please address your questions to the board. Uh, and I will have the appropriate person answer that if necessary. Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Crystal Reddy, 56 Address. I have a, a few questions and comments. Did you say that as to date, this, um, there have been no mixed use? Developments that have been prevented by the current bylaw in the lot area for dwelling unit Well, not that we know of. And um, I guess what I'm wondering is if this is a desirable thing, why does it only apply to mixed use and not all residential developments? Um, you know, we took kind of a go slow attitude about this because of the fact that we're recodifying the zoning bylaws, so we wanted to keep the changes to a minimum. That, I guess that's my next question, is why isn't this being considered as part of the larger zoning recodification? Why is it so necessary to do it as a separate ad hoc change this year? Um, the zoning recodification is not going to change the um, substance of any, uh, of any bylaw. It's only changing the, um, the form. And you know, well, it's cleaning it up. It's not. We're, there won't be any sub substantive changes to the zoning. But isn't that the next step after they clean it up? There will be. Possibly. Yes, there will be more changes proposed. Possibly. Yeah. That hasn't been decided yet. I guess I'm I'm wondering about the need for this, um, particularly for the higher number zoning districts. As I calculated, at 700 square foot per dwelling unit, you're at over 62 units per acre. If we look at the larger residential developments in town, Brigham's, Simsite, they were much lower than that already. And I don't see any need to reduce it to zero when you have very large developments that are already well below this, the limit in the bylaw. In those cases, it doesn't seem to be controlling at all. <clears throat> the other concern I have about this, and the B1 zoning district is single family and two family houses. The town has repeatedly rejected even adding an additional unit as an accessory apartment. And now what you're proposing to do is add an unlimited number of units, as long as it's called mixed use, and you put some, some business use in it. Um, that to me seems like a real end run around the intention of town meeting expressed repeatedly for preserving those properties as one and two family houses without the intensity of use of, say, converting them basically to a rooming house. So what you're saying is there's no limit on the number of units you can put. So I would, I would strongly object to that. I think this should be considered as part of the broader zoning uh, recodification and beyond when you start looking at the recommendations of the master plan. And it shouldn't be limited to mixed use. My feeling is the town really um, got to get over it's this mixed use infatuation. It's just one tool in your toolbox. It's not everything. And, and you ought to be considering the zoning bylaw more holistically. So I hope you consider those comments and, and hold off on this, or at least eliminate it from the B1 zoning district at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, comments, concerns? Yes, Mr. Knight. Hi, uh, Jonathan Maber, 129 Lake Street. I just wanted to comment say I think the positive aspect of this change will also 
possibly allow for a more diversified group of people living in the building. So if you have a one bedroom or a studio or a two bedroom, you're not going to get all same type of people, which could also I think, just add to the fabric of our community. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> With Article 6 throughout the evening, uh, I will leave public comment period open. Uh, the board decided at our March 6th meeting uh, to take votes on any articles heard this evening. Next week, uh, we'll give the public additional time to apply and to chime in. Uh, all of our email addresses are available on the town website. I encourage you to access those and comment if necessary uh, to all of us and to staff. Uh, I have another question. Uh, Laura, when you looked at the other uh, neighboring communities to see what they had done with respect to this. Um, did they uh, did they remove um, the uh, minimum lot area across all of their business districts, or, or did they kind of mix mix and match? Uh, I would say um, all of them except um, I want to say Watertown, but I'm not. Uh, uh, let me look back at that, but. They had no minimum lot size requirement. I don't know that they removed it. I think they never had it in the business district. Okay. But some of them didn't have it in any district. Lexington didn't have it anywhere. So I think it's a little bit more restrictive than many other communities. Thank you. Sir, can I ask one clarifying question? But did they have limits on the number of units in, in a particular zoning district? Um, they, you know, each one was different and complicated in its own way. So right in front of me, I have Watertown. Um, units per, there, there was, there is no requirement, oh yes, there is, okay, I'm sorry. So in the two family zone, there's a limit of 1,500 per dwelling unit, 1,500 square feet of air of lot area per dwelling unit, um, and 1,000 in a slightly more dense housing district, but in the, all of the business districts, there is no lot area per dwelling unit requirement. But is there any other limit in some other way of the number of units on a, on a lot in those districts is what I'm asking? Not by the uh, uh, No. Well, the, you know, there's the usual minimum lot size and frontage and things like that, but no. Not in, not in, water, in Watertown. Thank you, Lauren. <coughs> Seeing no other questions on Article 6, close <coughs> that open. Move on to Article 7, zoning bylaw amendment for definitions. Uh, artisanal fabrication to see if the town will vote to amend the zoning bylaw Article 2 definitions for artisanal fabrication by increasing or removing the maximum square foot area requirement or take any action related thereto. And I'll turn that over to Laura Wiener. Okay. Um, so, this is again also a tweak of something that we created last year. We created a definition of artisanal fabrication, which is um, small industrial use of hand tools, um, et cetera, in, in self-contained areas. Um, in, and it included uh, small breweries and commercial kitchens, which are two uses that are really on the rise and, and, and growing in our economy. I don't mean Arlington's economy, in the Boston area. Um, we put a, a um, limit in the definition of 5,000 square feet. In talking with our new economic development coordinator, Allie Carter, she looked at this and said, that's too small. And she did some research for me to help me sort of understand this better. But she said that a brewery needs more than 5,000 square feet. And a commercial kitchen might start at under 5,000 square feet, but if they do well, and grow, then they would have to leave. And um, since it's a fairly large investment, starting at the beginning, you know, uh, to start up, um, she felt that that would inhibit that kind of business coming to Arlington. And we have, it is true that we have not had any, um, any uh, artisanal fabrication businesses come in in the last year. It's only been a year, but still. Um, so, uh, it was her suggestion that we eliminate that maximum size of 5,000 square feet, and um, the staff concurred with her having looked at um, some similar businesses. So we, we were proposing removing the sentence that said, uh, we're 
production, operation, storage, and materials related to production occupy no more than 5,000 square feet of gross floor area from the definition. And this again, this allows businesses room to grow if they do decide to stay in Arlington, allowing to stay here mm -hmm. continue to expand. Thank you. I'm in support of this article. Sir Ken. Um, is there a increase, maybe a maximum something of some sort where let's say a brewery or one of these kitchens come in, what are the maximums of it? I mean, is there do we are we by limiting it altogether and not having, let's say, 20,000 is the maximum, so that opens up all the things that can come in there that we don't want? I think, um, you know, uh, we've, breweries can be, you know, any size. If you only want small breweries, then, or commercial kitchens, or any of these things, then we could, we could limit it to 10,000. I think that would be within scope of this article, if you prefer to do that. Um, I think we thought, like, if we really want to attract this kind of business, why put a limit on it? But that, that is up to you. David. Do you know whether there have been any uh, inquiries uh, from prospective businesses that um, you know, saw the limitation and, and decided not to pursue an opportunity here in Arlington up to this point? Um, we did talk to one person who was representing someone who was interested in a brewery, and um, but it was pretty preliminary, so it's hard to know why it didn't go to the next step. You know, it's hard to find space also. Mm -hmm. That's appropriate. So, yes and no. Preliminary only. Andy. Uh, in favor of this, I think uh, the small businesses and artisanal fabrication are good potential uh, uses for the town and, and tax income and so forth. So I, I think it's a good idea to not to limit and to go with the bill as proposed. Gene. I agree. I, I'll just add that I think the possibility of having business that employs people in town is a positive step. And one of the other <clears throat> things that I've seen, these kind of artisanal uses create our community spaces, uh, natural, organic gathering spaces uh, for residents to get together with one another, get to know each other, they hold activities, they draw people in. They're really beneficial for the community. I don't want to put any kind of cap on that if possible. Uh, questions from the public? Thank you. I was wondering, with this particular brewery, um, is it your interpretation of the bylaw that they could not in locate in the industrial zone without a limit on the size? Uh, the limit is in the definition. Yeah, but the, 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 the definition applies to artisanal manufacturing or production, right? <clears throat> but, but before you amended the bylaw to put that in, you could still conduct a lot of these same activities in town under the existing bylaw, at least I would argue that. For example, right now in the B4 and the B, in the industrial zoning district, there's something called light manufacturing. There's no limit on the size of those. And what I'm asking is, for example, in the example you gave for the brewery, why couldn't they just locate that in the industrial zone, assuming space was available? Or would the bylaw currently be interpreted not to allow that? I think so because it's listed in this definition, I think that it would have to be interpreted as um, being in this category. I guess I'd like to echo one of the statements or, or questions of one of the board members about whether this is appropriate throughout the town. I think the key word here is artisanal. Um, and when you get into larger facilities, for example, the um, Arlington Automatic Transmission in East Arlington, which everyone knows as the eyesore that's been there for years. That building is over you know, 3,000 square feet. Um, is it appropriate to have something more than 50% bigger in a B1 zoning district as a brewery? I'm not sure. Um, certainly in the industrial zone, it doesn't matter. In some of the higher numbered business zone, it's zones, it's appropriate. For some of the smaller zones, 
you know, I, I think I think you I think there's a question there you know, of whether you're really getting into artisanal production or whether you're getting more something akin to industrial production in a zone that was never zoned that way. And I think something that's something I would ask the board to give some serious consideration. Just to point out, I'm looking at, at the zoning bylaw <clears throat> as it went in last year. Currently, artisanal fabrication is by special permit across all uh, zoning districts in town, except for industrial works allowed by right. But there is some control over that before it's allowed to open in, in any business district. Right, but once you take away the, the limitation, you know, then you're getting into a battle with proponents about whether it's allowed or not. If you have the limitation there, you just, you've got the law on your side. Um, and I think it'd be very difficult for the board to reject it just based on the size if it otherwise met all the requirements of the zone bylaw. So, anyway, that's, thank you. Mike. Other questions, comments, concerns? Uh, other comments, questions from the board? Again, this uh, public comment period will remain open until next week when we take our vote and have further deliberation on Article 7. We are a few minutes ahead of schedule, but I believe our proponents on Article 8 are here. There's an objection, I think, in that. <coughs> Article 8 is uh, Zoning bylaw amendment regarding residential driveway and parking accommodation and zoning changes. Although this article is being introduced at the behest of the redevelopment board, the work on, behind this has actually come out of the residential study group, which was established uh, following town meeting last year, during town meeting last year, as a result of the proposed zoning warrant articles that uh, were ultimately put forth no action uh, there. <coughs> this group has met for several, several hundreds of hours for the last several months, uh, met more than a dozen times. It's comprised of a wide-ranging swath of experience and, and residents in town, uh, members of the development community, uh, members of the citizens group that have put forward a number of articles last year. Uh, I'm a member, and there are other members of the Master Planning and Participation Committee, uh, members of staff, and one of the things that I've, I've wanted to say and have said over the last several months is that the, these meetings have not always been uh, easy to get through, but they've always been cordial, and everyone has, has really worked hard to get toward the same goal. Uh, one idea that was latched on to from the beginning, pulling from town meeting last year, was the idea of changing driveway slopes. Uh, that was something that everyone in the room really got behind and started to put forward. Uh, realized there were some other different effects that could be had uh, on zoning in town and residential construction. Uh, tonight we have Winnell Evans and Steve McKenna from the residential study group, who I am going to turn the floor over to and let them present the, the warrant article. You can come up to the floor here, both of you. Uh, again, introduce yourselves, name yes. and address, both of you, please. Okay. Steve, um, I had a chair for you, but it disappeared. I'm sorry. Manager to the residential study group, 2040 Place. And I'm going to speak briefly about the history um, of this article and what some of the benefits might be, and then I'll pass it along to Steve. Um, there was a lot of interest in a version of this article last year, but I think it failed for several reasons. Um, can, you hear, can everybody hear me? Um, I think it failed for several reasons last year. Um, I think we failed to explain two things. One, that it was not retroactive, that it would only apply to new construction. And I think a lot of people were afraid they were going to have to start excavating or filling their properties. Uh, it did not specify that it would only apply to downward slope. So I think a lot of people had a very hard time understanding what would happen with, with um, driveways that went upward. Um, and it didn't really offer a lot of options to builders. So we came at it from a slightly different angle this year and really focused on the safety aspect of the downward sloping driveways. Currently, Arlington has no regulations for the downward slope of the driveway at all. Uh, the Massachusetts Department of Transportation recommends 10 to 15 degree slope. Cambridge is at 7.2. Belmont's at 15, um, a lot of other communities in, in eastern Massachusetts fall in the 10 to 15 degree range. 
we have driveways in town, particularly in East Arlington, that are at 28 degree slope, approaching a 30 degree slope. So this is pretty significant. Um, and it presents several safety issues. Uh, when you are backing out of a driveway that's steep, you cannot see anybody on the street or on the sidewalk, particularly a small person. Uh, you're just seeing the sky. Um, several people have noted that people don't necessarily park in their garages, um, so they're parking at the top of the slope and thereby blocking the sidewalk, and in the wintertime, this is detouring people out into the street, so that is another safety issue. Um, the, a grade greater than 15% can also cause damage to some cars, so there, there were a lot of factors there um, that we took into consideration. So we have come up with this, um, this recommendation that we impose a 15 degree limit, which is a little bit more generous than some surrounding communities, um, which will ameliorate these safety issues. It will also have some other benefits, um, which is that these very, very steep driveways, particularly for a two family, completely replace the front yard with an asphalt pit. Um, so by regulating that grade, we are hoping to incentivize builders to consider some other options, which we'll talk about more, um, but return a little bit of the street life to these, to these structures, which otherwise really do not allow for it. Um, it will also start to control a lot of these, these um, the buildings with the, the garage under for these steep driveways can sometimes have the appearance of a three and a half story building because the, the garage level looks like a story. So we're hoping that we will be able to start to control for that as well by again, trying to, trying to shift people away from this. Um, so that's kind of the background and, and rationale for this and Steve will talk a little bit more about how this might actually work out. Thank you. Um, I'd like to echo uh, something which we said earlier at the previous meeting as well and, and by Andrew. Um, all of us that are part of the residential study group have not only spent countless hours and, and energy together, but we've created an opportunity to understand what the opposing sides were concerned about. And although we were in opposition on how to achieve the goal last year, one of the things that we recognized was that the safety was a paramount concern to everybody on all sides. And we looked at different ways on how to resolve the issue that would be beneficial to all parties, mainly to the residents of the town and to all the abutters. What we've done is we've not only had meetings and, and talked about it for countless hours, but we've been out to site visits. And we've um, looked at all different types of construction that has been going on throughout the town for the last few years. And through that, we then determined that it was appropriate to put together a survey that we send out to people that have been affected and involved with a lot of the construction that has gone on over the past three years. Um, that, this whole experience, I think, for all of us in the board has been enlightening. It's been an eye-opening experience, and it's been a factor that we can understand why some of the articles were imposed last year, but also understand why they weren't approved because of the way that we were drafted. And we're trying to get to that point. And what we're faced with and challenged with is it's a huge puzzle. We're not going to resolve every single issue this town meeting or this year, but we're going to work on it and piece it together so that it makes sense for everybody in the community on all sides. And <coughs> to start with, one of the things that we did was we sent out a sur this survey that we sent out. We started getting feedback. And it was interesting that with the feedback, the commonality for almost everybody was not a lot of the things that were mentioned in the town warrant articles that people were grieving about. It was the fact that nobody was ever notified. And the communication was lacking. So that's something that we've addressed earlier, and that's part of what we're trying to put together with this puzzle. And we've come up with a comprehensive construction agreement that we're hoping is going to get approved that controls situations where the developer has to inform the neighbors, the abutters within 200 feet of what's happening. And that's a critical element of what we're trying to propose here in our article. Because it's just not the article, it's what we're doing now, what we're proposing in the future. And we're looking at the safety, the look of the town, 
we're looking at what's comfortable for the neighbors, we're looking at what's reasonable to develop and keep the industry growing, keep things happening here in the town. So with that, I'd just like to suggest and propose what we've suggested, and then we can answer any questions. The, the article, um, as Winnell said, we've come to the determination that we're going to change the grade to 15 degrees. And in order to do that, that puts a lot of onus on the developer. And the first thing is that it's going to require them to push the house back a little bit further from the street to allow that grade to be lower. And depending upon the lot configuration, the lot size and dimensions, it will determine if the house is gonna be going back three feet, five feet, six feet, whatever it may be. That in part, because of the zoning bylaws, is going to have an effect on the overall size the developer's allowed to put there. It's gonna increase their cost and, lose, and limit their profit. So we think by making that restriction and putting that in there, it's gonna force them to look at other issues. And it's important to note <coughs> that the zoning bylaws, the way they have been drafted, have allowed these garage unders to be built because it mandated that two car garage parking, two car parking be required behind the front foundation wall of any new construction. And because of the zoning bylaws, developers had to do the garage unders because if they did surface parking to allow for two car parking per unit behind the front foundation wall, they would end up with more impervious area than was allowed by the zoning bylaws. So every reaction, every action had a reaction. So we looked at that and determined how to address the situation appropriately. And we felt safety was paramount. So we did eliminate right away the idea of these steep driveways and trying to change the grade. So by doing so, we felt it was important to provide some incentives to the developers to not build the garage unders and to create a more harmonious feel within the neighborhood within the, not only the, the zoning bylaws, but within the appearance, because people are concerned about the overall look of it. So what we've come up with are some incentives that would create, let me get this back on, um, an opportunity where, first of all, as I said, the garage, two-car garage, it would be impacted by the grade change. What we would do in order to persuade the developers to construct the proper housing with something that would fit into the neighborhood, is change the two-car garage parking behind the front foundation wall to one-car parking behind the front foundation wall. In reality, if you look at everything that's been built over the years, and if you drive to people's houses, most people are not using the garages for car parking. They're using it for storage. And because we were, the developers were required to do the garage unders, these houses had no storage space because their basement was their garages. So therefore, the cars were being put out into the driveways anyways. By eliminating the two-car garage under, the developers are now building a full basement, whereby this, that takes care of the storage. It then eliminates the concern for the steep driveway. The one-car parking situation, they either have to put it behind the front foundation wall on the side, or they put it like on several houses down on Park Street they put it right in the first level of the living space. And those units have come out very attractive. That enables the developer to stay within the zoning bylaws, create a safer atmosphere and environment for everybody in the neighborhood. And also, from a streetscape standpoint, it's much more attractive. The next thing is that by generating this situation with eliminating the garage unders, it allows the developer, it almost puts the developer in a position that by limiting it, they have to build a smaller home. And that was a concern that came up last year as well. It's the overall scope and size of the homes. So we looked at that and, and that's an opportunity again that benefits the town because it's something that they were looking for in the neighborhood. What we've talked about also is if there is gonna be driveways to the side of a house and abutting a lot line, there should be a buffer area. So we're suggesting a buffer area, a vegetation area, that will separate that from, if you go through, and I don't want to pick on Medford, but if you go to Medford, they have pavement along pavement along pavement. It's not attractive. So we felt as though that's something to generate and create a more harmonious feel within neighbors, neighborhoods, and creates a little bit more of an appeal. Um, the, the other item that we're proposing is in order to 
generate the approval of all these developers and to create an opportunity where it's beneficial to all parties that if they agree to or if they eliminate the garage unders, they get the benefit of the one car garage parking which we're talking about, their cost savings is better. But what we're talking about is then eliminating the 25 foot in the open space requirement, we now have a 25 foot horizontal line that is required to be maintained. And these graphs that you're looking at does not probably depict it as I noticed because it should be 25 feet, in most cases it goes along the entire back lot line of open space. So we're suggesting that we go from 25 feet to 20 feet. Now this is an incentive to have the developer not build the garage unders. It does not mean, based upon the floor area ratio, the gross floor area, that the house is going to be bigger. It just gives the developer an opportunity to then, if they're putting a garage parking space in the main level area, which is approximately 200 square feet, they're gaining that 200 feet back to be able to make that living space. Um, and, and so with that, we've tried again to look at every action as a reaction. How do we benefit the community? How do we make, allow the developers to build more safer houses? How do we make sure the growth is proper, the appearance is, is right? And we think that this is a good approach from all sides that works for the benefit of people in town. And again, when Elle and I were on opposite ends of how we wanted this to be achieved, we come to terms where we understand, and the, and the entire group has, what's better for the town. There has to be give and take, and it's a puzzle, and it's going to be a long process. But we think that this is something that these proposals at the beginning of some good work, good opportunity to make better growth, and to make sure that people and within the neighborhoods are feeling that they are, are involved in understanding what's happening with the, the opportunity that we're providing with notification, but also that we've heard the concerns from last year and we're trying to address them each way as we go forward. Thank you. Just to, to clarify before I get to the rest of the board, there are several proposals that have come out of the residential study group and Steve thankfully touched on all of them. Tonight we're only discussing the driveway issue. Uh, there was also a slate of town bylaw changes that went uh, to the construction control group that we spoke about. Those went in front of the board of selectmen tonight. Those are unanimous in support of the go forward at town meeting. Um, this board will hear more about that later on. Uh, we will not be taking a vote on it. It won't be done in a public hearing right. context. No, 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 that, that's fine. It's, it's good to emphasize how much work has come out of the residential study group. Uh, there's also uh, there's Article 8, which we were discussing tonight. There's also a, an Article 1 for a special town meeting, which will be heard at a public hearing next week, uh, which regards the um, contiguous open space requirement, uh, reducing that from 25 to 20 feet. If there are questions about that tonight, I will allow those to be asked, uh, but we'll get to that in the time. <coughs> um, so, Ken. Well, I want to commend you guys on all your hard work the ability to actually look past your differences and work together. I think this was uh, very encouraging uh, how society can work together. Uh, let's, um, I'm very supportive of what, you, what you've come up with. I think it's a fair compromise. Uh, keep in mind uh, the main uh, focus on the safety aspect, while, while still not deterring homeowners from expanding their uh, their property and actually being able to live in Arlington and continue to live in Arlington. But it's a great town. One thing that's important to know, piggybacking off of that, is this bylaw amendment affects only new construction mm -hmm. and large additions. It does not affect <coughs> the existing homeowners uh, who want to do just about anything to their own property. So it's, it's not a retroactive change. <coughs> Anything further? No. Okay. David. Uh, I'm supportive of this, and uh, I am also very pleased with uh, the collaborative nature of the work that the residential study group did on this, uh, and uh, the way in, in which it found a solution that was acceptable uh, to um, some fairly divergent viewpoints. Uh, I remember last year the confusion <coughs> over last year's attempt to address this issue, and um, you know I think um, this is a much more clear solution. I, I do think it, it still has a number of moving parts, uh, only one of which we're, we're talking about right now, but 
I just want to emphasize that at, as this goes forward and uh, if it is all presented to town meeting, uh, it will uh, still be very important to make sure that um, that uh, it's very clearly presented to town meeting how all the different pieces fit together and interact with each other. And I agree with uh, what David said. And I'm in support of this. Jane? I think the safety aspect is very important. I spent some time this weekend trying to actually read the highway manuals or mass DOT or federal highway or anybody where I could find the 15% and I couldn't find it for downward sloping driveways. So I'm hoping that someone on the staff can actually send me some since I couldn't find it. It's probably there. I ran out of time. What I did find, however, were uh, many documents that talked about um, a 15 degree slope max going up for safety reasons, not going down. And that just sort of leads me to wonder that wasn't the intention of why you were doing things. And I understand that, but it sort of leads me to wonder if I can only find that safety issues with upward sloping driveways that we don't have um, that as part of the consideration. So I had a second point. I'll, I'll just say briefly, the, it, the, the upward sloping driveway does not have the same visibility limitations that the downward sloping right. driveway yeah. does. You can, you can see behind you. And we, we also thought that given the topography of Arlington, uh, the steepness of some of the, the lots, that that was really going to be difficult to, to enforce town-wide. Um, it just it kind of opened a whole different vista for this. Gene, the 15% the issue was um, something discovered by Elizabeth Pyle, who's been an instrumental member of the group. Yeah, She's not here this evening, unfortunately. Um, I think she will be next weekend. Probably I read tomorrow. the material she sent us, but I couldn't get from the material she sent us to an actual document. Uh, we, can get that. we can get that. So that'll be helpful. Yeah, we'll get that for you. And I think he had a response. Sure. Uh, Michael Ruderman, uh, Alton Street. Uh, I also happen to work for the Mass DOT. The slope uh, indication of 15% as a prospective design limit comes from the sightline question, which if you are driving up over that slope is essentially the same as if you are trying to look in your rear view mirror and back out of an ascending driveway. The sightline question is the same. Your sightline rises so fast above the horizon, you can't see what's literally right underneath your bumper when you get to it, whether it's going over the crest of a hill or coming up the slope of a driveway. It's the sightline question as, as we were told here. You do not see who or what's on the sidewalk. You don't see what's over the crest of the hill. So the 15 degree slope has become sort of a rule of thumb, if not written into specific places, as the limit to which uh, we've got to look at designing it differently. Thank you, Mr. Reardon. My second question relates to reducing the contiguous open space on the side of the house. How necessary is that to your proposal? And what would happen if that were not part of the whole package? Just to be clear, and I'm going to allow for the answer, just for point of information, the contiguous open space relates to Article 1 for right. special town meeting. But, but you did say yes. But you can go ahead and answer yeah. that, Steve. Um, we feel, and again, it was something that was heavily debated during all of our meetings, um, to understand why the reasoning was. And we feel that it's important that, again, if you're taking away something, you want to give something back. And you're talking about the potential of eliminating 200 square feet of living space if you allow the developer now to put one car garage parking instead of two car garages in the living area. If you can imagine from a perspective of visualizing if you were to have a two car garage for, every, for townhouses side by side, they can't be built because of the size of the lots. Lots are 60 feet wide, so you can't have four car parking garages. That would not look great. So we're now proposing that with the one car parking going in, they're losing 200 square feet, basically a little bit more than that, because the garage parking space is 20 feet deep, usually about 10 feet wide. So eliminating that 
you have to then, we feel as though we wanted to give them at least the bonus provision that we're given the opportunity to lose that opportunity for living space, let's take it back. And one of the biggest things that we've noticed is that if um, many of the cases in front of the ZBA have been that they don't meet the 25 foot setback requirement, the open space, that one dimension. A lot of times it's 20, 21, 22 feet. So our feeling is that this would then make it easier for people to meet those requirements. And it also is a benefit for the developers not to go forward with the garage owners. And we think that's the critical part. Because the garage owners have been the biggest concern and we think this is a way to get the developers away from that. And so by taking that opportunity away from them, we're giving them an opportunity to create that space. But again, from, and Rick Valoretti can talk about it, we don't believe it increases the overall size of the house at all based upon the FAR, the GFA regulations. It's also not changing the existing requirement for open space and it's not changing the, the existing Correct. requirement for impervious material. Anything else for a, on that? Andrew, that, that, that's a good point. Just to clarify, this is not changing the overall open space requirement on the lot. Right. right. This is allowing flexibility. It's, it's a, a nice give back, but it's also it's a way to allow all of this to work together. So they, they still it's not the total open space. It's a contiguous open space is given a, a dimensional flexibility. Right. Mm -hmm. They still have to meet the 30% open space requirement. Right. Or, or, nor does it affect setbacks. Right. right. So what we may see are, are different houses from what we've seen so far, and different designs that currently exist in town. Uh, but it's taking away some of the more controversial uh, design aspects that we heard coming out of town meeting last year and through the survey process. Uh, <clears throat> this fall. Uh, before we get into public comment, I, I know there are a number of members of the residential study group here this evening also. Uh, Rick Valorelli, the back in the building department, just wave. Uh, Jonathan Nyberg, uh, Janice Weaver, who's back there. Janice, everybody, uh, is there anyone else I'm missing? And, and every member of that group really deserves uh, commendation, thanks for the amount of hard work they've put in over the last several months, uh, sitting on a lot of these committees. Uh, through my role here, I, I think that's probably my favorite one to go to. No, no. Uh, negative should be taken from that to any of the master plan implementation committee here, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's really been great to see this diverse group of people with varying interests get together and work and put forward some, some more articles that we can really be proud of. Uh, we have a lot of work still to do. We do have a lot of work still to do. This is this is step one of many. Uh, we're already setting our agenda for what will come after town meeting. That being said, uh, questions from the public. Mr. Wood. John Warden, Jason Street. Um, yeah, I've got a couple questions about this. Um, um, the, the article here says 15 percent, and Mr. Mc uh, Mr. McCann said 15 degrees. Uh, Mr. Mr. Benson talked about degrees and percents, and, and I, I don't know 15 percent of what. I know I can understand 15 degrees, and people know about this stuff and can do math. Not my thing. Uh, have explained it. It's incomprehensible, but but um, I, I think we ought to pin that down. 15 degrees is. Uh, I mean, I think, I think we you can figure that out because you know. It's 15 percent, and I'll turn it over. Oh, Rick Valor really to answer that. Yeah, John. So, 15 percent maximum slope to structures that are in the scenario. Um, the, the the minimum distance that the house can be set back. And this is, by the way, this is taken from the furthest most front property line to the garage. 15 percent of what? 15 percent is the, the the distance, the amount of drop from the front property line to the threshold of the garage, that drop cannot exceed 15%. So the scenario would be to make that happen, and this is what's not happening today, the house would have to be set back 26 and a half feet with a drop of four feet of unbalanced fill to maintain 15%. I still don't get 15, what is the 15% of the height of the house? No, it's the, it's the, it's the rate of slope. Drop three feet. Hmm? It could, means that a driveway 20 feet long could drop three feet, correct? It's illustrated. Uh, there are some handouts in the back. I, I know you have some of them. It's illustrated in this particular drawing. You can see how those okay, driveways I, 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 I saw the pictures, but I, I didn't yeah. know what you were measuring exactly. It's, it's a percentage 15% of the length of the driveway. Correct. So we have okay. some houses uh, in East Islington, for example, set back 22 feet with a drop of 
four and a half feet, we're at 26%. Yeah, I, I know. Yep. So that, that, that's the problem we're trying to address. Okay, well, as long as, long as that is clear, uh, we don't want, to want anybody to be confused. The other problem I have with this is, at the very end of the article, um, uh, cutting back the required number of parking, uh, required parking places. Uh, how many households, even in this room, have only one car for their family? Steve or Winnell, do you want to answer yeah. that one? Okay. So the, the answer is that what we're talking <coughs> about is the legal parking space is one car parking space behind the front foundation wall. The setback for most of these houses is still 25 feet. So you're still going to have a 25 foot driveway getting you to the front foundation wall for a garage or for the side yard setback. Okay, so I, I you still have the ability to fit more cars. Oh, oh, okay. So everybody parks in the driveway anyway. Uh, right, uh, exactly. With the garage because yeah. it's theoretically leading to an allowed parking space, which is filled with junk. Exactly. Uh, oh, wait. <coughs> storage. Sorry. Um, we all have a lot of that. Um, I built a two-car garage, so, I mean a two-story garage, so I can't my junk upstairs. Um, the, the, but I, I think what is not clear is that the, the one, that one required space must be behind the front wall, and the other one can be in the front yard, I guess. But I, I think that's not clear when you say there's only one required parking space. <coughs> it doesn't per take unit. away the it doesn't take away the requirement for parking space until it exists. What it does is it says that one of those spaces, single family house would require two parking spaces. One of those can now be behind the foundation wall, one of those can be considered in the driveway. It's not pushing cars out into the street. You know, what it's doing is it's I, I, no, shifting. I, I understand that's the intent. I submit that the language is not does not make it clear. Well that's that's unfortunately that's the warrant. Language no, no, the warrant, I know, I know, the warrant language is the warrant language. The, the, when you get to the vote, I would suggest, as someone uh, as stated earlier, that the clarity of the presentation is very important. And I think a lot of people are going to look at this, as I did, and say, oh, you only need one car, one parking space. The selectmen are going to be inundated with parking on the street petitions, which they don't like very much. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you specify that basically the one required parking space is behind the, behind the front wall, but you still have to have two parking spaces. So you can have the other one in the front yard like, like they do anyway. But I, I think that ought to be made clear or people, <coughs> I think, land on this same parking in the street. Okay, business. understood, thank you. Thank you. I yes, just wanted to second that because I had the Can same. Can you stand up and, and say your oh, name and address, please? I'm Hillary Graham from Pine Ridge Road, and I just wanted to second that comment because I read it and went, what? One parking space? That's not going to work. So I just want to support that I think it needs to be clear or there's just going to be a lot of blowback as it sounded like it happened maybe last year. So. Thank you. No. We are also going to have um, graphic support of this beyond what you're seeing over there that will show how these various options might look. So, Mr. Larry. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple of questions um, before I make a few comments. Um, since the building inspector is here, could we ask how many of these pit houses were constructed last year? How many were single family and how many were two families? Well, of course, mainly it's the two families that have the slope driveway right. um, to support the required four parking spaces. Uh, 15, um, the past year, 15 and 2016 combined, the two families I believe were six. So what I did is I took the number from the last three years and there was a total of 12 two families with this scenario only. Okay. And I took the, uh, I hope I'm answering your question, I was getting three off track. Three years. Three years. Three years yeah. and 12. Right, with this scenario, with, with a slow driveway. New homes were constructed during that time total, would you say? I have the information. Um, I have it with me. If you give me a minute, I can get it. So we did, I think we, we had 14 in 2014 and then 16 in 2015. Um, I have that information. I'll, I'll, I'll give it up. But that's the approximate number. So we're looking at 15, 16, 17 houses a year in the last. Right. Yep. Um, I guess it couple of comments. One, I think the limitation on the slope is fine. If it's a safety issue, it, it should be enacted. Um, 
and it should be enacted by itself. I'm, I'm not supportive, or on the second thing, a little unclear about the buffer. Um, the comment was made that this applies only to new houses. Um, where I live in East Arlington, typically there is no buffer between the edge of the driveway and the lot next door. If somebody wants to extend their driveway, do they then have to put a buffer in? I don't believe so. I think it only applies to new construction. Newly well, constructed homes. Where do you get that idea? But the way this is the language, because I don't read that in this article eight at all. It doesn't say anything about new homes. It's in the warrant, Chris. Newly constructed single two family duplex or three family dwellings. Mm. We're in Article 8. <coughs> in Article 8. Yeah. I'm looking at the proposed language change, the amendments to the bylaw, and I don't see anything about the new homework. Um, Present to districts to allow for incentive service parking with newly constructed single two family duplex or three family dwellings, amending Article 8. Article 8, Section 8.07, parking in residential districts to allow for incentives for surface parking in newly constructed single two family duplex or three family dwelling. But that's not part of the requirement. That's just a general description. That's not part of the bylaw. written it applies to um, any house of course you're not going to most people aren't going to be putting in a driveway under their existing, garage under their, their existing home uh, but they may extend their driveway even for new homes it's not a, it clear to me at all how that buffer applies if you look at other parts of the bylaw where it talks about uh, buffers for parking it will define the width of the buffer and the height of the vegetation um, this doesn't say anything about that so you know, with a, if a developer wants to put in a six inch buffer, is that okay? Of grass, does that cut it? I don't know. Um, but my main concern is with this uh, one parking space for dwelling unit. And uh, even if this only applies to new development, I think it doesn't appreciate the way the lots are laid out and the way construction actually occurs. These, these pictures are great, they're completely unrealistic because new developments will be built out to the um, side yard setbacks. They're gonna be built out to 10 yard setbacks. I mean, 10 foot setbacks on either side because that's all the bylaw requires. In East Arlington, where you have two family homes, as Rick said, most of these get under driveways are two families. That side yard driveway forms an essential um, um, area providing space and light to the home. And if you take that away, you're going to have houses 15 feet apart because a lot of the existing setbacks are not 10 feet of these old houses. They're five or, or even less. And you take that away and you don't, you've got these houses built right up next to each other. I see that what's going to happen when you, when you remove that requirement, it's not just that you're removing excess parking, it's that you are allowing bigger houses to be built. I guarantee it. And that's the way they're built. I think rather than looking at these theoretical pictures, I think it'd be really useful to look at the plans for the houses that were actually built and see how they correspond to the setbacks and how they um, relate to the houses next to them. Because I don't think this is keeping with the character of the neighborhood at all, which is one of the specific uh, desires and intents of, of, the, of the master plan. So I would, it seems to me this, this um, provision for taking out or reducing parking spaces by half should just be eliminated. Or, or if you are going to keep it in, you make a requirement that where the space that is eliminated is eliminated, that that be preserved as either landscaped or usable open space that in the future can be converted back to parking if needed. While there are you know, some houses in East Arlington that maybe there is only one car per, per dwelling unit, that is definitely not the norm. And anyone who lives in that part of the town can, can tell you that. Uh, so anyway, I would, I would urge you um, to drop that last section of this and go forward with the, uh, the restriction on the slope of the five Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just respond to that, Chris. The, um, <coughs> the reality is, so the zoning bylaws, the parking space has to be, is 
eight and a half feet by 18 feet. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that if the setback is less than 10 feet without a vegetated area, then no one can open up their doors. Because in order to open up your, your door, you need an additional two and a half to three feet. So if you have both people trying to get out, passenger and driver, you're talking about an extra six feet. So quite honestly, the way we looked at it is with the one car parking, and if they're going out, they're going to do the garage in front, and you have to have a vegetated area, that the house is gonna become smaller because they can't meet the requirement to have people park the cars. They'll be able to pull the car in, but they'll be able to get out of the car. And I think that when you look at the reality set part, setbacks of them, that's what's going to happen. Developers will be looking at it because the parking is eight and a half by 18. I understand, um, but I, you know, I don't have a problem with making the houses smaller. And I, again, that's in keeping with the character of the neighborhood. Uh, you know, one of the, this, we're kind of getting in, I don't want to get into the change for next week, but the uh, typical house that was built in Arlington 90 or 100 years ago is not built out to the setbacks. Um, you know, on, on the, particularly on one side and on the rear, the way the new houses are being constructed. And well, we understand that, but that's not what we're discussing yeah. tonight. Okay. Uh, Anybody? Other questions, comments? Yes. Just one comment. The other challenge is, too, I understand that we have different neighborhoods in Arlington, but we're also trying to come up with something that we can apply to all of Arlington. So it makes it somewhat challenging. You know, you may have a specific situation in East Arlington, which would be totally different to the morning side and the heights, et cetera. So as a group, we're trying to look at also the best fit that can apply to everybody. Thank you. Again, please email us, let us know. Right. Great. Go ahead. Uh, last year, 2016, we had a total of 14 single-family homes and five two-family homes, new construction. Um, sorry, 2015, the year before that, we had 27 total new homes, of which 14 were two families. And the year before that, uh, 2014, we had 21 total with five being two families. Now, based on what's happening this year on my desk, we're going to have a strong year of new, of new two and single family homes. Uh, March and we're already looking at potentially seven. Do any of the single family homes have these driveways down under or is, or is it all two families? Nothing comes to memory. Nothing comes to memory. No. So we're really talking about two. Not saying there isn't, Chris. Yeah, it's yeah. just kind of any two. I think for any specifics, I'd ask. You have a conversation with Rick or Mike Byrne outside. So, thank you. Again, I'll leave public comment open until the vote takes place next week. Uh, thank you, Quinnell and Steve. Appreciate it. Center buffer zone. Uh, before we get to begin, and I will reiterate this uh, as we get into the public comment period this zoning. This proposal regards only a zoning bylaw. I will not tolerate any discussion of the special permit that was already granted. I'm not interested in any discussion over whether it is or is not appropriate to have medical marijuana in town. That's already been voted on and approved. I want I want to ask everyone who's here tonight to please be respectful of that. We are here to discuss a buffer zone uh, and only a buffer zone. With that, I will ask the opponent, Karen Thomas Allier, to step forward, please, and present the bylaw. Thank you. I didn't bring a lot of copies with me, but I noticed there's a black and white copy of the map in the handout. I have a color copy, and I'll just pass it around because it's a little bit easier to read than the black and white copy. Um, in the 
the map of <coughs> the pink and red is where presently medical marijuana dispensaries are allowed. Pink is what would be disallowed under this buffer zone, and red would remain. So it's in black and white in the handouts, it's just the black and white little part. <coughs> um, so uh, the history behind this is kind of complicated, so I'll just go through it so that everyone's on the same page. I know that ARB people have heard it many times, but just so everyone in the room understands. In 2012, the state voters approved medical marijuana, and the state law uh, stated that uh, R&D, so a registered medical dispensary, shall not be cited within a radius of 500 feet of a school daycare center or any facility in which children commonly congregate with distance measured in a straight line to the nearest point of the building. The definition of facility in which children commonly congregate and many aspects of the straight state law were quite vague and were the subject of debate for the next few years. In 2014, town meeting approved restricting RMDs to the B3 and B5 business zones, that's red and pink on the map, with the verbal understanding that the state buffer zone still applies. In other words, RMDs can locate within B3 or B5 business zones <coughs> as long as they are within, or as they are 500 feet away from any facility in which children commonly congregate. At the recommendation of town council Doug Hine, the town did not mention a buffer zone in the zoning article because the state's definition of a buffer zone was still under debate. So we thought that would introduce problems to put anything specific in the, in the warrant. However, in August of 2016, the state ruled that if a town's zoning rules do not explicitly mention a buffer zone, then no buffer zone applies. Um, and there was quite a bit of consternation in the town as a result of that state ruling. In October 2016, a lawyer for the marijuana industry, Valerio Romano, proposes a warrant for town meeting for a buffer zone that is much narrower than state law. For example, Romano's proposal would allow an RMD next door to a preschool and ambiguously, but probably, next door to private schools like Arlington Catholic High School. He also defines the distance between buildings as the distance a person would walk on the sidewalk. ARB and town meeting voted against Romano's proposal because it was too narrow. At the meeting, the ARB stated that the town needs to pass a new buffer zone. Uh, in response to that, in January of this year, Jason Cofield and I, uh, Jason back here, uh, proposed a new buffer zone. Uh, it was drafted after surveying buffer zones in many neighboring communities, Burlington, Belmont, Canton, Yarmouth, Westboro, other towns. Um, and we chose the language of Burlington because it seemed the most precise and simplest. The Burlington buffer zone defines places where children commonly congregate to include public libraries, pediatrician offices, athletic fields such as dance, or athletic schools such as dance schools, and parks with playgrounds and athletic fields. Uh, we had several meetings with the Board of Health to discuss the buffer zone. Uh, and at their suggestion, we agreed to revise the buffer zone. So in the handouts, you'll see the warrant as originally proposed with the Burlington language, but also the revised buffer zone that came out of dis discussion with the Board of Health. Uh, and the main reason for this revision was to make sure that there was still some place in town where a dispensary could be cited, because we knew that we weren't allowed to exclude dispensaries entirely from the town. The revised buffer zone defines places where children commonly congregate as athletic playing fields where organized permitted events occur, licensed child care programs, licensed residential care programs, those are uh, like youth programs, and public and private schools with distance measured in a straight line to the nearest point of the facility. Um, the Board of Health and the Police Department have both given their support for the revised buffer zone. Um, and we also had a meeting last week with the ARB to receive your input, uh, although no suggestions were given uh, during the course of the meeting, but we talked for about 45 minutes in terms of what the buffer zone should include. 
Um, at this point, I'd like to quote from some of the discussions that occurred during the October 17, 2016 hearing of the ARB, at which the Romano buffer zone was discussed. Council Heim said the B5 plus B3 zone was recommended in 2014 under the understanding that the state buffer applied. This statement was seconded by Mr. Bonnell and Mr. Kayer. Council Heim stated, having no buffer zone is a difficult place for Arlington. Several people re reiterated that the goal here is to reinstate the state, that the state buffer zone applies. This is what we have tried to do. Mr. Watson asked, if we reinstate the state buffer zone, are there still areas open for RMDs in the B3 plus B5 zones? Yes, we have shown that on our map. Mr. Watson further asked, we need to consider this more. We need to include more types of facilities in the definition of places where children commonly congregate. We have attempted to do this, making sure that all places that we mention are consistent with the guidelines that have been issued by the state over the past four years regarding the state's interpretation of places where children commonly congregate. In short, we have worked with the Board of Health, the ARB, and the Police Department to define a buffer zone that meets the needs of Arlington. Personally, I wish we could use the language of the Burlington buffer zone. I would like to be able to protect places like dance schools, pediatrician offices, and public libraries. But we recognize that compromises are necessary, and we need this compromise in a town with a diverse population to make sure that it's the best place to live for all of its residents. Finally, let me reiterate why a buffer zone is necessary uh, in response to some questions that came up in last week's meeting. Uh, there was question as to uh, what is the intended, or what kind of harm are we trying to prevent. Um, so the American Academy of Pediatrics published last month a detailed summary of studies documenting the harmful effects of marijuana on the developing brain of children and adolescents. The American Academy of Pediatrics strongly recommends that people younger than 20, age 24 not consume marijuana, and it goes on for pages and pages in the report about all the ways that this harms the brain of young people. Um, I will make all of these references available to you. Um, our Director of Health and Human Services described last week that a key concern is normalizing marijuana use. So if you walk by a store every week that sells only marijuana, you might start to think that it is a normal thing. Some people have asked how a store dedicated to the sale of marijuana is different from a CVS which sells prescription opiates. The difference is that when a parent is walking their child by a CVS, the child associates CVS with buying diapers, tampons, pencils, and shampoo. How does a parent explain to their children why young adults have looks of glee on their faces as they exit the marijuana dispensary? Unlike a common CVS, which serves everyone in a small area, a dedicated marijuana dispersed dispensary serves a po small population, all with a common interest, brought in from a wide area. Other dangers that we are trying to prevent with this buffer zone. There have been many news reports from Colorado, which has been had uh, legal marijuana for a few years now. There have been reports of children ending up in the emergency room after accidentally ingesting marijuana edibles, which are often packaged in a way that looks like candy or cookies. Colorado has seen an increase in marijuana use among teens, leading to discipline problems in schools, along with driving under the influence accidents, the latter of which cannot be under a, made too small a deal of, as we lost a member of my own family to such an accident. Our chief of police described last week that he is hearing anecdotal evidence of increased burglaries around dispensaries. For example, thieves stealing from customers as they go in or out of the dispensary. And I have a reference also to a study which also found increased <laughs> risk of burglaries around dispensaries. Our chief of police is concerned that children could be harmed if the theft occurs when children are present. Among the 168 residents of Arlington who have medical marijuana prescriptions, I'm sure that many are good law-abiding people seeking relief from diseases. But equally surely, that description does not apply to all the customers who would come to an RMD. The Boston Globe has already reported on physicians who give marijuana prescriptions to anybody who asks, 
and have then had their uh, doctor's licenses revoked as a result. This is not a zero-sum game. We can meet the medical needs of Arlington residents while also protecting our population of more than 6,000 children. We are embarking on a great social experiment of drug legalization. Let us do it thoughtfully, averting potential problems before they happen. Thank you very much. Questions from the board, specifically about the buffer zone, not about the appropriateness of marijuana, not about uh, how these cards are prescribed, specifically about the effectiveness of the implementation of the buffer zone, please. Can I ask a couple questions? And I'll stop you from there. Also, if we ask the questions to some of the board members here, this article has to be introduced by us in order to get a, a yes. vote. Yes, yes. And also, just to back up as a point of order, we do have some revised language that will also have to be presented as a substitute motion for the town. Okay. Uh, All right. Because I'm very much, I've been thinking about this for a while, and I'm right now kind of on the fence on this. Um, and I was thinking that, you know, I don't want to be the one that sort of, or be part of the one that decides for town. I, I think I'm kind of supportive of letting the uh, town meeting decide uh, is this appropriate or not, and get a wider body of people to decide this, uh, this article. But if we don't support it, then it never goes to town meeting. Is that true? I mean, or what is, that's what, right. What do you, what do you no, guys? That's right. I mean, by us endorsing this, then are they saying that we're supportive of this while they do the decision? I'm, I'm kind of tossed right now, and, and, and um, I, I don't know, I'm just, right now, can't decide. You know, I mean, there are good points, and there's also other points, and right now, I, I just would like to kick it up with the town, me uh, town members decide if this is uh, what they want or not. I mean, just as they decided, to allow this, or to allow, uh, I don't know, it's, it's a very tough choice. I just want to see what, what the rest of the board members think. Uh, are they feeling strongly, like, like indecisive like me, or do they feel like one way or the other? David? Uh, I completely agree that uh, I think this issue should be decided by by town meeting. Uh, I do feel that procedurally we are in a situation where we, we have to take a position um, uh, and uh, we would have to support it for this to go forward, uh, you know, because um, the, um, the previous um, proposal uh, last year failed. Um, and I think um, to help us get some level of comfort uh, and, or, or help us uh, make a decision on this, I think this is our opportunity to get brought in and put in um, the, the public hearing process uh, because uh, you know, uh, if there, I would feel if there is significant public support expressed here, um, then, you know, perhaps the board would feel more comfortable um, letting this move forward uh, to be voted on at town meeting. Um, you know, if there was significant opposition expressed here, then that might change the calculation of, of what the board thinks is the appropriate process at this point. Yeah, that's a good answer. Andy. Yeah, I'm, I'm the one who mentioned the CVS and the liquor store as, and I'm, your answers and Chief Ryan's answers last week were not convincing. Um, I don't know, a look of glee coming out of the marijuana dispensary. They're all fairly reactive 
I think that over time, I <coughs> hope that a marijuana dispensary, medical marijuana dispensary, is going to be looked at like a drugstore. Uh, the town voted overwhelmingly that this is a good use going forward. Um, there are a lot of fears. Uh, Chief Ryan talked about, well, there's a, a resale right afterward, like you might have if someone brought a six-pack of beer out and sold it to someone on the side. All of those things are kind of part of what we deal with in a town. And I think in the long term, those things get settled out, just like having a dry town, which is now a, a liquor town. So I don't really, I don't think you were convincing, and I don't think Chief Ryan was convincing last week in really making a, a strong case. However, and I asked at the very end, Chief Ryan, do you think this is a safer town under the conditions of the 500 foot buffer? And he said, yes. So I find myself in a very similar situation as, as Kim. I think that it probably needs to go to the town to make that decision. I, I don't feel that it's, I, I, you know, I, I think it's the wrong thing to, to go for. However, I feel there's enough, there's enough pressure in the town and enough opinions in the town that I think maybe it's time to hear, hear them vote on it. So that's, I find myself in a similar <coughs> condition to you, Ken. Yeah. <coughs> Andy, I think that's a good point. I tend to agree with you. I think some of the, the things that have been brought up uh, as, as why we should support this don't actually support the idea of a buffer zone. Uh, children being exposed to it outside of a 500 foot buffer zone or finding it in their homes, this doesn't do anything to protect that. It's, it's, I question the idea of a buffer zone to begin with. I don't know that it's effective beyond any other point than uh, the normalization aspect of things. But I, I, I know that from testimony that we received back in the fall, this is this is a dispensary. This is a this is akin to a pharmacy. This is not uh, a recreational site. This is not a place where people can use these goods on premise. You know, they they do have to go away. They have to, to go back to their home or go somewhere else to, to use this. And again, the, the buffer zone doesn't stop any of those things from from happening. Um, and I think we, we look at control of the facility itself. We look at police practices. We look at education. Uh, how families behave, how we raise our own children. I think those are, are paramount here and extremely important. Um, let's go far beyond saying, drawing an arbitrary circle around a, an area and saying you can't put it here uh, because of this. I, I don't think it's there. That being said, there's been enough discussion over this uh, the last several years that I think it probably is appropriate to, to put it in front of <coughs> town meeting with the caveat that, that there is some dissent on the board as to whether it's the appropriate way to go. And I don't know how to phrase that in right. court to town meeting, saying you know, we're, we're sliding this over to you because we think you can handle the, the decision. Uh, we don't feel it's one that we can necessarily make. So we don't necessarily endorse the article, uh, but we feel that it's appropriate for town meeting to, to opine and vote on it. I think that's warranted because we, we approve the current medical marijuana facility based on the no buffer zone. So sorry you did not no, 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 it's not true. We were tricked into thinking there was a buffer zone. Well I object to, to that language, Mr. Ward, but if you go back and listen to the recording of your own meeting, every person up here with the exception of yourself said quite clearly we voted for B three plus B flat with the understanding that the buffer zone still applies. Nobody wanted a medical marijuana dispensary <coughs> next to Casa Esme or next to Great Expectations or any of the other preschools that are right on Mass Ave. I, 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 I'd have to check that. I, I well, go ahead and check because I listened to it and it was right. very clear from I everybody in the room. I don't think it was a trick. I think it was us saying that, that we as a town, the police, the health department, and all of the committees can make this decision in a more rational way than what I call a kind of blunt instrument of, okay, just draw a big circle around it. So the reason sick. being is that, and I understood that Chief Ryan said, look, I, I, I want to be able to know where this thing is. Being in the center of town or a place that we patrol is better than putting it out on Dudley Street or somewhere up by the reservoir or wherever it ends up because it's more natural. It's like where you, 
So you have a CVS next to a high school. Is that a big danger to children? You have liquor stores that are very close to other facilities. Is that a big danger? I think you have to start so, sir, living yes. with that. Okay, if I could address this. Is it? Yes. yes. Sir, two wrongs do not make a right. Let's not do something worse just because we've done something I, bad in the past. I just feel you're and for, Furthermore, you yeah. need to go back and listen to your own meeting from October 17th okay. of 2016 I, I like that, because yeah. Council Heim laid out the issue very clearly and he specifically said the only reason why a buffer zone was not included in the B3 plus B5 zoning rule was because state definition of a buffer zone was so ambiguous that he didn't want to put in specific language when there was ambiguity going on and state memos going back and forth changing the definition of a buffer zone. And my recollection of that was that <coughs> the state's position was still unknown. <coughs> I believe the state's position is still unknown. We don't have any possession from the state. Right. So, so Council High sounded very, very disappointed that the state ruled that the buffer zone didn't apply. Well, I don't want to refer any more to Council High without him being here. Sure, but I'm just I'm quoting from that that meeting and from what was said by by everyone that's that's up here right now. Sorry, there was general. You were the only voice in that meeting that that heard differently that the B3 plus B5 was intended to have a buffer zone next with it. Nobody wanted an RMD next to one of the many preschools that are located right on Mass Ave. Gene. I, I should say for the record, this is my second meeting on the board, so I'm a little bit newer to this than, than everyone else. I, at the meeting last week where you came and the health department came, Chief Ryan came, <coughs> everybody to me made a very compelling case that we want to keep marijuana away from young kids. I think that's a very compelling case. However, nobody made a compelling case to me that these buffer zones were the way to do it. Um, when we're talking about a medical facility that might be in an office building that's not right out selling things on the street. So that was my problem when I left the meeting last week. And I just want to hear what people here tonight have to say about that and what their feeling is about it, because I think a lot of people have spent more time thinking about this than my recent introduction and, and, to the issue. And again, I'm about to open it up and I'll, I'll start taking questions. Please raise your hand, I'll call on you, stand up, state your name and address. Please keep your comments, your concerns, and your questions specific to the idea of the questions being asked here. Is a buffer zone appropriate? Why should it be there? Opinions about the use of medical marijuana, opinions about medical marijuana are not appropriate. Opinions about the Water Street facility and any of the conditions of their approval are, are not appropriate and won't be tolerated in this meeting. I'll ask you to sit down if you, if you do take it beyond the scope of what we're discussing tonight. I realize this is a controversial uh, article, an amendment, and I want to keep the discussion respectful and on point. So, ma'am. So I'm Hillary Graham from Pioneer Road, and I, I just wanted to take issue with drawing a parallel between a CVS and a medical marijuana dispensary because a CVS sells many different kinds of products and the prescription opiates are not visible as an aspect. I mean, yes, they are prescribed there, but I think it might feel different if we had a prescription opiate dispensary as a an independent facility. So I, will, feel, I will say, just to, to count it a little bit, we don't have one in town, but there are other towns that have specific pharmacies. There's a Walgreens in the town of my office is that is only a, a pharmacy. It sells almost nothing else. These these do exist. They don't have a exist in our own But it sells so right now Walgreens they items sell, as well. They sell and primarily and no, they sell batteries. it's a pharmacy. Okay. It's essentially a prescription counter. Okay. So anyway, I, I don't think it's a it's a legitimate comparison to, to call the CVS the same as a and my second point is just that you know, if there's citing the marijuana dispensaries sort of in the center of town next to the library, there's no choice about whether children see it and it becomes a regular part of the routine. Citing it outside of a buffer zone, I don't think inhibits any access to anybody who is has a, their um, prescription to fill. So. It seems to me that it's not denying anybody access who needs it. It's not denying the town 
medical marijuana facilities. It's just allowing people not to have to have it part of their everyday life with small children, for example, who go to the library, who go to the preschool, who, you know. So that's, that's my opinion. I don't, I don't understand how it hurts the medical marijuana dispensary to, to be in a certain place because people are specifically going there, whereas people who don't want to go there might not want to have to. Just to, just to counter that at that point, and I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with you, people go to the doctor's office. You don't tend to notice them going in and out. People go to the subway. You don't notice them going in and out of the library if you're that far away. I'm still not sold on the buffer zone, and, and we'll get there. Sure. Good evening. Hi. Uh, thank you. My name is Natasha Whedon, and I am the Lead Health Compliance Officer for the Arlington Board of Health. Um, my office is here at 27 Maple Street. And as you may recall, Christine Bongiorno, as you mentioned before, uh, Director of Health and Human Services, <coughs> as well as Chief Bongiorno, I'm sorry, <coughs> Chief Ryan. <laughs> there is a Chief Bongiorno. <laughs> uh, so my apologies. Uh, both of them, as you had already stated, were here uh, last week. And we're here in representation to um, show you their support of the buffer zone. And I'm just here basically um, on behalf of the health department, Board of Health, um, <clears throat> as well as the Arlington Youth Health and Safety Coalition, <clears throat> here to show you our support again tonight. And just to reiterate that what we're looking for is really just as you all said it. Uh, we're not looking for you know your board to make a decision on whether or not the buffer zone should be um, in place or not in place. Sure, um, we think that it should be in place, but we're asking merely that um, the original intention when B3 and B5 were chosen as <coughs> places for these medical marijuana dispensaries to be zoned, um, the understanding <coughs> at town meeting was that there was also going to be a buffer zone. And so what we're just looking for and, and what we'd just like you to understand in, um, you know, is the importance of, of what was originally put forward. Um, unfortunately, the state <coughs> had, yes, rescinded their, um, their information in regards to the zoning. Uh, and so because they were zoned with the B3 and B5, said that a buffer zone was not applicable. That was not the case when this went to town meeting. Um, people that voted at town meeting were under the impression that there was going to be a zoning um, buffer, buffer zone. So, you know, again, I just want to re reiterate that. I also have with me here tonight um, the director of the Health, Youth, and the Safety Coalition, Ivy LaPlante, as well as one of our um, coalition members, um, who's a concerned parent, a coalition member, um, and is very active in the community. And his name is John Sheft. And I'd just like to make sure that he gets an opportunity to speak with you because he has some really valuable information on this topic. And so I'm happy to sit down now. Um, but if I could turn it over to John, or if you'd like him to wait until later on. I, I'll have him wait. There are other people sure. who are here. So thank you. And thank you so much for, for hearing us. Go ahead. I, I just, uh, wanted to ask, can we just make clear sort of what the procedural status of the of the currently proposed dispensary is with respect to this uh, possible zoning change? Because I think there's, I'm hearing some potential confusion about uh, about what possible effect changing this bu the buffer zone now might have on the on the currently proposed dispensary uh, on Water Street. Sure. Jennifer Ray, Director of Planning and Community Development. My understanding from Doug Heim is that the uh, town council is that there is no impact to the currently uh, proposed and almost completely permitted uh, recreational, I'm sorry. <laughs> That was a bad, <laughs> bad mistake. <laughs> the R I would have said R M D. Um, the R M D. Medical marijuana. The medical treatment. marijuana treatment center at 11 Water Street. My apologies. Um, is there would be no impact to that facility. So um, that was a follow up from last meeting, and that was his reading of how this would or would not impact that facility. I would just say that we, we received, um, and it's not provided to you as a letter, but we received a late letter from uh, the attorney who I believe is I believe here, they're here. Um, yeah. who had some comment and feedback to also, also share. Um, so I think we want to. We'll get to that in the back, sir. 
Hi, my name is Jason Cook. I live at 94 Robbins Road. Um, I think the board's really hit on the issue that you are really facing. Um, I think you have to distinguish between the merits of the buffer zone, which I think is more appropriate for town meeting to opine on than yourselves, and I'll get to that point in a second, and the procedural aspects that you're facing. I was a town meeting member in 2014. I voted on this B3 and B5. And if you go back and watch the tapes from that debate itself, it's on ACMI, it's clear that all the, the, the focus of the debate at town meeting was on the applicability of the buffer zone, the state buffer zone, to these two zoning districts. And the fact that essentially this, it was essentially the, the rug was pulled out from town meeting. Um, by the state, <coughs> uh, because the state couldn't really get their act together and understand how this buffer zone applied to towns that didn't explicitly pass it. Now we're put in a position where we have to actually explicitly pass it. And I think all we're asking you to do tonight is give town meeting that chance. Don't substitute your judgment, the judgment of five individuals, for town meeting that's democratically elected by this town um, that had opined on this in the past. They should be given a chance to at least correct that mistake that the town, that the state has forced them to be in um, and not have to wait another two years in order to try to pass this. Um, and so I respectfully ask you um, to pass this with the understanding that town meeting is going to be the ones that decide on the efficacy of these buffer zones, whether they want them or not. And really, you're just allowing town meeting that chance because they were, they were denied that chance uh, two years ago uh, under the understanding that it was implicitly, implicitly uh, uh, put into the to the uh, to the zoning districts. Now it's not, and we just need to le have at least to have a chance to correct that, that mistake. Thank you. Pete Howard, uh, 12 Wilton Street. Um, I urge you, whatever you decide, to uh, if you decide no action, make an expl explanation of why. Uh, it greatly helps the town meeting understand what's going on if it's written down and not just spoken. And if you decide to do something, please explain that also. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, thanks for hearing me. My name is John Sheft. I live at 70 Richfield Road. But more importantly, for your information, I've been before the Supreme Judicial Court twice on medical and also on the legalization of marijuana. So have some real familiarity with the law and the regulations. And I just want to make three quick points to you. The first is, however you zone for medical marijuana, you are also zoning for recreational marijuana. And that's critical for you to understand. Because in question four, if you look in chapter 94G, section 3A, what it says is, you may not zone medical marijuana differently than recreational. The other thing that question four does is it allows medical marijuana dispensaries to automatically transition into recreational sales at the same location where they're providing medical services. And so when you talk about zoning, you're not only talking about the medical marijuana program, you're also talking very soon, July 2018, at the latest, you're talking about people coming into that medical marijuana dispensary and purchasing recreational products you're also looking at new rules that are going to allow them to market, have different signage, they'll be under a different agency. So that's critical. Now, the other thing I think it's important to know is that however you zone medical marijuana, there is no business disadvantage. And I thought you made a nice point about that. What the regulations say is, if you are a medical marijuana patient and you have a card, you can go into a dispensary and you can purchase marijuana for your medical needs. It's not a business that needs to be marketed. It's not a business that needs a storefront. In order to go there, you have to have a card. So it's not as if you're citing a location where you're disadvantaging them by not allowing them to visit. Well, we're not we are talking about citing the location. Tonight. Well, that's what I'm saying. The <coughs> so I do want to get away from that and the confusion there. And, and I understand where you're going with this. But. Well, I want to be sure you do, because my point is where you cite this particular business does not make a difference to it from an economic model, because the only people that are supposed to go there already have a medical marijuana card. So why would they want to be in a more visible location? Because there is going to be an automatic transition under the law to recreational. And that's the thing I think this committee has to be very, very aware of. 
The other thing that's important to note is, you're right, the buffer zone isn't perfect, but one of the things that we've seen, I can send you if you want a white paper that was done in California, is there's tremendous collateral problems with medical marijuana dispensaries. Think about it. It's a business that's not allowed to use federal banks. So many of these dispensaries are cash businesses. If you're interested in robbing somebody, think about it. You've got people entering with cash. You've got people living with expensive marijuana and marijuana products. The other thing is we found with these dispensary locations that you have significant loitering around them. You have use. The other thing is we're not talking about Arlington residents. This is going to be a regional draw for people who have a medical marijuana card. So you're looking at other issues. You're looking at young people in those buffer zones coming by, congregating. You know, one of the things we found in Denver, Colorado, they did a study and they found that now, after there was medical marijuana in that state, 75% of first time users ended, ended up getting diverted medical marijuana. So there are significant risks. Also, the process, you have to understand these dispensaries create a number of concentrates which they're allowed to do under their licensing. To create the concentrates, they do manufacturing processes with butane and protein. This is, and this protein. is far outside of what we're discussing tonight, but I, I, I do appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I would just say I don't know if it's far outside. What I'm just it's saying is- It's far outside of what we're, we're discussing. But there are things that happen when you license these businesses inside. And there is a, there is a, there is a detailed, significant licensing process that is completely separate from whether we should recommend that a, a, I agree a vote with on, that. on a buffer zone go to town meeting. But why would you want those activities taking place within 500 feet of places where kids congregate? That's what I'm pointing out. It's not just what happens inside the dispensary. There are things that happen outside that create collateral difficulties for public safety, bad driving, those kinds of things. So I just put that out to you. However you zone this, that's where recreational marijuana is going to be. And even if recreational isn't there, you're going to have collateral problems that are going to affect kids in that zone. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Christine Brennan and Kyle Harris. Um, I'm glad that that point was made because I wasn't sure it was going to be out of order, but the, I think that understanding that where medical facilities are now um, will be where recreational facilities are then is important, actually. It's one of these connected decisions, not unlike the driveway one, even though we can only talk about the one piece for very, very good reasons. And so I just, I wanted to note to this question, I think if it's not clear yet what the medical health or safety issues are from the perspectives of those experts, it might be time to talk to them again. I just feel like in these conversations, both about medical and recreational, there's been less investment than there should be in the public health professionals and the police professionals and the teaching professionals that actually end up working with the issues that are created when these things happen. And I'd just like to see us do that a little bit differently than the state has done um, in some of these proceedings. So I think, you know, you can imagine like, what might happen in front of these spaces, but we're imagining partly because it's new. And so I think my question is why would we want to experiment with the new in such a vulnerable space? So it might be that there's congregation, that there's resale, at the site, that there's consumption at the site. I work at Harvard Square, and since we got legal, it's a lot of consumption. <laughs> and you walk through, you know, in certain spaces, certain spaces become a hub of activity. And I, you don't know, we just can't prove it, because we've never done it before. So I just wonder why we want to do it for the first time next to preschools and high schools when there are other spaces available. And the people getting into these businesses know they're moving into a complex, regulated space. So they're ready to take on some complex regulation challenges. And there are the places to go. So I just wonder why it was something so unknown when you start the most vulnerable spaces. And I also think voter intent is hard to parse. I know lots of people who read things super carefully who did not read either of the two ballot initiatives as closely as they might. Might even include some of us. I read a lot of it. I read some, some passages nobody had seen before. Um, that surprise them. So I think voter intent is hard to parse, but I think we can know voters, at least at the state level, both times voted for provisions that included buffer zones. So I think to assume that they didn't want that would be a little bit presumptuous on our part, not to carry it to them, at least give them you know, an opportunity to clarify that. Um, and so the last thing is more of a question. 
I noticed that this conversation feels different than the last three. Um, and in the last three, we had a lot of conversation about benchmarks, other towns, and how they're moving forward with these things, and about property values, and some things that are even perception, like landscapes of 10 feet and five feet between houses. Um, and I think it's important to think about five years from now, the story we'll tell about Arlington and about property values. You know, will it be a story of why we were the only town for miles not to just institute the same buffer zone that was the default at the state level because we had a procedural glitch that accidentally disallowed the town meeting from making the same decision it thought it made <coughs> two years ago. So I actually, that's a genuine question. Like I see you all wrestling with this hard, and I think it must be about some rights and some values of people in medical need, and I think that's real. So I would just actually love to know like why this feels different, and if there's something we could do to address that so that it follows up with more, like some of the other conversations where you know, benchmarking and property values and stuff are like part of the conversation. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Uh, Michael Ruderman, 9 Alton Street. I can tell you that the town meeting thought it knew and thought it didn't know certain things about the discussion. The town meeting thought it knew that the buffer zone would exist because this was something that we were inheriting from, from state law. The town meeting did not know what the black and white definition of areas that primarily serve children or where children uh, commonly congregate would be. But having the uncertainty of, of not having, having the list of the definition of those places, town meeting felt more comfortable voting for the B3 and the B5 uh, allowance for marijuana dispensaries with the understanding or the presumption that there were going to be 500 foot buffer zones which came along through the state. Members of the board here who were seated uh, during the discussions from last fall will remember the consternation in the hearings when we learned that the buffer zone provision either had never existed or was not going to be enforced or the state was pulling back at least. And that there was no buffer zone and there was no concrete black and white list of areas where children commonly congregate. We put the two of those together and there has been a lot of displeasure and unease and sentiment against the whole process by which marijuana dispensaries were first voted in the town. Town meeting would like some clear definitions. Town meeting thought the definitions were going to include 500 foot buffer zones. Town meeting is asking you for some clear definitions. If you don't want to vote on it, you can abstain. You can have you know, a one to nothing vote with four abstentions or, or, or a zero zero vote and everyone abstains and you simply return it to town meeting without a recommendation. Parliamentary uh, procedure would allow that. You don't have to say yes or no, but town meeting wants some clear answers so that we can then vote yes or no. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to speak on this, but I was wondering, will the um, Water Street proponents be speaking since you mentioned you have some correspondence from them? We received correspondence too late to make it into this meeting. It will be discussed at the next meeting. If they'd like to speak, they're more than welcome to. Oh, but are you I haven't had the chance to read it in full. Or just a clarification, are you going to continue public comment into the next meeting? On this article, I intend to. This one only? I, I, on all articles, I've said that I will leave public comment open until the vote. Okay, thank you. I didn't understand. So should I speak then, or are they, were you offering them the option? Why don't you go ahead and speak, Chris? Um, I guess what I see this um, issue really as, as a matter of truth and advertising by the board. You know, there's a number of people have spoken about the understanding at town meeting when the B3 and B5 zoning districts were approved for medical marijuana dispensary. That understanding came directly from your board. If you go back and look at the presentation that was made by the chair at the time, he, he had the description of the buffer zone on one of the slides. He said that um, it would be part of the review as well. And he said the town gets the benefit of having the state buffer zone. And so it was clearly part of your, I mean, your board sales pitch to town meeting. It wasn't just something town meeting members developed an understanding of on their own or from other people. It was from the redevelopment board. Now, certainly if the board, and, and at that time, the board could have said, we don't want buffer zones. 
We're not going to have them. At which time meeting and presentation are you referring to? I'm referring to, this goes back a couple years ago, when the B3 and the B5, which year? I think it was 2014. Okay. Um, but it was the annual town meeting when you zone those, when you made those two zoning districts, the districts that allowed medical marijuana facilities. If your board didn't want buffer zones, you could have put that into the, to the bylaw that you passed at that time. You didn't do that. You could have changed the bylaw at any time after that to remove the buffer zone that the state had or put in a different buffer zone if you wanted to. That didn't happen. It seems to me you shouldn't be relying on the state flip-flopping on the, its own interpretation of its own regulation to change what's, you know, what the town was regulating. And uh, you know, if, if indeed you were putting that forward at that time, it seems to me you, you should be doing it again just to reinstate what, what people voted on at that time at town meeting. Otherwise, you should ex be explicit. You should have explicitly put in a uh, an article to remove any buffer zone in the town. Of that didn't happen. So I appreciate you know, the proponents taking the initiative to do this. I think it's something, frankly, the town should have done as soon as they learned that the state had changed its interpretation, which was the basis of the bylaw, the zoning bylaw being passed in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hillary Graham, Pinehurst Road. Um, I am hearing that you, at least for maybe all of you, are um, struggling with this issue. And I guess I, just for my own, I don't feel that educated about it, but I would really love to hear what um, the argument against having a buffer zone, because that I, I don't feel clear about. And, and clearly all of you, you know, have real questions about that. So if you wouldn't mind, Explaining that, that would be very helpful. <clears throat> Anybody else from the board wants to take up that answer? Yeah, yeah I, I really see it, and I tried to learn last week from the group why it's different from a pharmacy going forward into the future. This is something that could be a great value to sick people. Um, it's not a pot shop. And this point was thrown around so that it would sound, okay, it's a legalized marijuana condition, it's a pot shop. It really isn't. It's a medical marijuana dispensary. The point was made that there's collateral. People are going to be around there. There's going to be more, there's going to be more activity. I'm not even sure that the buffer zone is a good idea in that case. Don't you want that to be where... The police can take care of it. It's, it's in an active part of town where there are others with stores, other um, restaurants with liquor licenses, liquor stores, drug stores, whatever. Um, we kind of live in a big, you know, it's a varied world. It's not, it's not just I can control this and I can control that. I don't want my child walking by and seeing someone go into a marijuana clinic. I'm not sure that I actually don't want the child actually going by and saying, Dad, Mom, what's that? Oh, that's a drugstore, or that's a liquor store, or that's a, really? Are we going to get to the point where we're saying, by hiding it somehow or by putting it off in a certain place? So I don't see it in the go going forward as really that different, as any different from a, a medical facility. Um, in the short term, I understand your point, and I really take to heart what Chief Ryan said and, and the group. That's why I'm inclined. Excuse me? My point? The point being made by the group that there's a collateral problem. It causes crime because there's potentially cash there. This is all ignoring potentially what has actually been said about the way the thing functions, but I'll accept what, what Chief Ryan is saying and others. But I don't essentially believe that it's a, that the buffer zone is creating a safer or better or long-term uh, better situation than allowing the town to place it where they want it, including the input from the Board of Health, Police Department, and others. So uh, that's my opinion about it. Um, I haven't really been convinced other than, uh, you know, arguments that don't seem to really add up. So, except that I feel it very strongly, and I hear your 
your angst. Everybody's worried about seeing it or what could happen. And what if someone got high and drove away? Which by any, by the way, they can do anywhere in the town they want to go drive high and drive away. So I'm more inclined to let this go to town meeting to make have the, a broader group make the decision. But I personally, if you ask me what you did, don't believe any of it adds up to a buffer zone. I don't see the logic. Would you put an RMD next to Casa Esme? Casa it's what? A it's a preschool that is on Mass Ave. Yeah. Would you, you would cite it right next door. Right next door. Is right now that's about RMD or an MMD? Uh, so just to, just to be clear, an RMD is a registered medical dispensary. Oh, okay. and it, the, the R, I think the, the more technical term should be medical marijuana treatment center or treatment okay. facility. I think it, using the letter R creates confusion with the idea that it might be recreational. Okay. Sorry. So, but, but to, so right now, in our town, we could put a, a medical marijuana dispensary could apply to be right next door to a preschool. We have lots of preschools that are in this B3 plus B5 plus zoning district. Yeah. You put it right next door. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm, I am supportive of implementing a buffer zone. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, we have heard the point of view of um, uh, the Board of Health and, uh, and the Police Department uh, and certainly a, a number of concerned citizens. And, um, you know, I, I understand the point since I was on town meeting in 2014 when this was voted on. Um, I understand the point um, that in, in a sense uh, we're, we're trying to get back to where we thought we were. Um, you know, and I, frankly, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if buffer zones are, are effective. Um, but, um, you know, I, I don't know if I'd be comfortable um, well, putting, putting, you know, a, 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 a dispensary right next to a free school. Um, is the dispensary going to be under the purview of a special permit? It would be. Yeah. Would yeah. it? Okay. Yeah. So the board would have the ability and the state to make those kinds of determinations that you know you don't want it. Really, the board has the ability to deny a, a permit to a facility. The board of health does. A spe the, the special permit allows for appropriate use and, a, and an allowance for what would. So the the board can deny a permit if the facility is not properly located. No, I think I, I don't know. I don't know how that would how that would play out. The, the 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 process for a site uh, medical marijuana treatment facility is is extremely complex. And I, I remember this from testimony. And I know the, the lawyers for the group are here, so they may want to chime in at some point. It isn't just file a special permit, open up shop where you want to to site one of these. They go through the board of selectmen. They work with the police department and Chief Ryan specifically to site. Uh, location in where they feel is, a, is, a, is an appropriate spot for not only for the business not to affect surrounding businesses but for the police to be able to come in and act if need be so that they have eyes and ears on things and building buffer zones pushes any kind of not just marijuana facilities not just medical marijuana facilities any kind of controversial site putting buffer zones in sort of pushes these out to the edges what you want with sites like this is for the police to be able to see what's going on. You want neighbors to be concerned and see what's going on. You want the eyes and ears of the community to, to participate here and, and observe the things that are going on and keep these businesses honest and, and on the upright. Um, would I cite a medical marijuana dispensary next to a preschool? I don't know. I don't think about it in front of us. I wouldn't deny it out of hand. I'd have a lot of questions to ask. There are a lot more that goes into that decision than just signing with that go come before us. I would hope that by the time it comes in front of us, uh, it would be cited in a less difficult location. Um, and I think the Water Street 
location is appropriate. That's why we voted yes on that. <coughs> um, the collateral issues are certainly something to be concerned about. Again, if you keep these locations in open and obvious areas, then enforcement becomes that much easier and pushing problems away becomes that much easier because you have invested neighbors keeping an eye out on the police and pushing them. I think it's important to say, though, that the, the Water Street facility, in our view, met the criteria that, that we could consider at that time. That's, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, you know, and we were, we were constrained uh, by the facts as they existed at that time uh, when, when that was brought before us. Can I, uh, uh, um, the Chief Police, Ryan, made a statement last week that his ability to enforce the marijuana laws are quite difficult. But you may recall that, that part of his, uh, his comments last week, right? That all he can do is ask someone for their name and address, and if they lie, he has no ability, he has no recourse. That's, that's not within our purview. That's up to... But my, my point is, you're all acting as if the police are going to be able to ensure that there's no crime in this area. And the police chief came to you and said, I cannot ensure that. Well, no. No, you're mischaracterizing what he said. And that question was regarding use, specifically use of marijuana. We're talking about robbery and, and loitering and other crimes that go beyond that, which is not a crime. It's a, it's a civil penalty. But one of the work has had her hand up for a while. So Yes. Um, just a very brief um, statement on this. Uh, I noticed some of the remarks have been uh, as regards whether or not a parent would be um, reluctant to uh, have such a facility without the buffer zone. And um, I have to point out that that area is one in which unescorted children of quite young ages are first allowed out on their own from the house to go to the library. And um, it's, it's a very dangerous area for children if there's that buffer zone. And I speak as a former member of the school committee and, um, and, and a former town meeting, and a present town meeting member, um, and one who, who had this before me during town meeting when I really thought that um, the most certainly would be a buffer zone because those children in town are among the most vulnerable because they are often there without a parent. Um, to answer, um, I guess, Hillary's question earlier, what our reasons are, what we see here, and I asked, I posed a question earlier, and I'm on a, and I, I couldn't, I'm on a fence here, and what I'm trying to say, from my opinion, what I've heard today and last week, most of the reasonings for having the buffer zone, I would, I would say I would disagree with, okay? And the only compelling reason that I would agree with right now is town meeting members had, had usually voted to approve this with a with an understanding of a buffer zone. So I'm sort of leaning more toward letting them decide again to react this buffer zone, which they thought they passed the first time with the buffer zone. That's the only reason, that's the only compelling reason I have right now, so far that I've heard from my opinion, okay? And you're asking me what our thoughts are and what we have. <coughs> I just disagree with some of the other opinions. I agree with Andy, totally. Where I, I don't see how some of these correlations work right now, okay? But that's okay, because everybody is allowed to have their own opinions, all right? And that's why I'm saying, well, the strongest opinion I see right now is town meeting made, made a vote based off a certain understanding. And if the understanding is different, let's give them another chance to decide. And it's a, it's a broader range of people. And I think, uh, Dave, you feel, I think you're sort of echoing something similar right here. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know, that's just, you asked for what we feel, and I'm just telling from the heart what I, I, I feel right now. Yes, ma'am. That's incredibly helpful. Thank you for answering that question. Sort of a question I had earlier too. 
I wanted to pose, I guess, just pose procedurally and I guess opinion-wise, how we, how we think about the fact that um, it has not been written that the recreational facilities cannot be denied anywhere that there's a medical facility. So we are making a dual decision as a community. And I know, I think there's a procedural piece here about trying to stay narrow, but it seems very hard to consider because it does feel quite different, the exposure or the potential unsupervised interaction with a clinic, absolutely, to me, than it does to a storefront with displayed wares and signage. And so I know that only one decision is happening, but they are both happening simultaneously. And it feels important for the town to understand that too. So how do we, how do we deal with that? Well, it's twofold. It, it, it is the great unknown as to how we deal with that, and that's something certainly to consider. Uh, I will also say that at a special town meeting, and it will be heard at our public hearing ne next week, is an idea for a temporary delay on any residential facilities being cited in town to give uh, recreational. Sorry, recreational facilities to be cited. Recreational facilities to be cited in town uh, to, to answer some of those questions and how we deal with it with the existing framework. But I'm, I'm confused because if, if that's true that a medical facility can become a recreational facility, is that true? Yes. So I'm gonna let I'm gonna let the attorney for the yeah I don't this is Adam Fine uh, good evening everyone uh, the chairman of the members of the board uh, uh, attorney for uh, Massachusetts Patient Foundation um, and we're provisionally licensed at 10 Water Street I, I'm just gonna speak as an attorney just because uh, as someone who's very familiar with the law and citing medical marijuana dispensaries throughout the state um, is working going to be working with the committee uh, the bipartisan committee that's going to be reevaluating question four making changes to it so I can encourage anyone to have any concerns about local issues or anything to, to reach out to their uh, state representatives or senators. But with respect to this automatic flip, and I just have to uh, disagree uh, with Attorney Sheff here, it's just not the case. It wasn't the intent of the law. The communities do have the ability to ban uh, recreational dispensaries. Right now it's through a democratic voting process, uh, and that will that will eviscerate any potential automatic shift, uh, uh, shift of which doesn't exist. We still have to, there's still time, place, and manner restrictions in question four. Um, there's also the ability uh, to put your own setbacks if you want to, in addition. Uh, so there's a lot of local control, and that was that was the purpose of the law. It's just, uh, it's just not true. We've, I'm happy to brief the board on that. Uh, with respect to, and I don't want to, I know that I don't want to go outside the scope too much, but I just want to, I don't, I think we need to, uh, if people have concerns about that, um, I'm happy to provide any documentation they need, but, but the, the, the people will be ultimately be able to decide whether or not they want recreational marijuana in their community. And moratoriums can go in place, and then there can be outright bans. We've already seen one community that has already banned them. So, um, outright. So, I just wanted to, to clarify that from my perspective as an attorney that uh, has a lot of experience in this area. Now, with respect to MPF, uh, we came here tonight because we wanted to be uh, Massachusetts Patient Foundation. I'm sorry. Um, so, you used to call them MPF. Um, we came here tonight really because we wanted to continue to be engaged with the community and obviously be available to answer any concerns that people have. This. You know, these bylaws don't impact us. Um, we had provided some comments just, uh, and I wasn't actually going to speak because it's not as applicable now that there's been kind of a modification, but uh, one of the, the concerns um, that we had with the initial uh, proposal, uh, just MPF, was that it would, we're going to be moving forward at the 10 Water Street, and we, and we know, uh, we're fully aware, we've heard from people that, that aren't particularly happy that we're there. We were open to, and still are open to, uh, discussing and engaging the community, engaging the town um, to the potential of moving if that was appropriate. You know, we think we're going to be, we know we're going to be fully compliant, we're going to work with health, we're going to work with the community, work with the police chief and make sure that we, um, you know, have no problems in the community. But to the extent that there was still a, a, a will and a want that people had, the Massachusetts Space Foundation uh, would be able to move, um, the, the first proposal concerned us because it basically would have eliminated any opportunity for us to site anywhere else. Um, because of the overly restrictive nature of setbacks. And without getting too much into the history of setbacks, they, the, the, the state, and I agree with you, has created a lot of confusion on this issue. We actually came into Arlington under, uh, and I don't want to you know, rehash everything here, but we believe that we were within the Children Commonly Concrete 500 setback rule. Um, it is a long, complicated process where it starts with us sitting down with uh, you know, the selectmen and presenting, and we still have to get a letter of support and opposition. I don't necessarily need to go into that. Um, but there is a lot of confusion, and, and, and the trend is, is that communities are moving away from strict setback rules into a more nuanced approach. 
that's what we had kind of uh, wanted to at least, this is uh, just speaking of what, uh, what places like Cambridge and Newton have done, uh, which is they, they may have a setback in place, but they'll also allow a board like uh, the Arts and Redevelopment Board um, to make exceptions in cases where um, the applicant can show a sufficient buffering in place, such as the, use, uh, the users of the protected use will not be adversely affected by the medical marijuana treatment center, which is commonly referred to as a registered marijuana dispensary. Um, and this, this is something that uh, we had proposed, uh, if, if they were going to go with a more restrictive version, proposed this, uh, along with uh, uh, showing that uh, the registered marijuana dispensary was fully compliant, that was operating in Arlington and was fully compliant for a year in order to make, in order to try to make a transition to a new location because we wanted the ability to do it to accommodate residents. So that was, that was kind of the limited nature of our comments. We would defer obviously to the voters, the will of the Arlington voters. We don't want to impart, uh, you know, we don't want to impose our opinion. It's not, it's not a really our place. It's up to the constituents of or the residents of Arlington. So with that, I'm happy to be available either now to take questions or anyone wants to talk to me after I'm here for questions. I, I do want to get toward wrapping this discussion up because we're now getting outside of our allotted time. We still do have another Warren article to discuss. Uh, and again, I will take further public comment at our hearing next week before we vote. Uh, can, I I'll allow, can you let me finish, please? Yes. <clears throat> and I will take uh, written comment for, to the entire board from people that won't be available. Please, sir. Very quickly, um, Attorney Fine is right in that the application process is complex. But what is not complex is question four is clear. You may not zone medical differently than recreationally. And the only way to prevent medical from transitioning to recreational is a special election of the voters. So your decision on this will absolutely affect recreational marijuana. And so when you do decide the buffer zone, you are deciding in many ways whether there will be a pot shop next to a local preschool. So, uh, Go ahead. That's something I'd like to have our attorney, just the town's attorney, weigh in on in writing this week. Is yeah. that that's something that I, I didn't have to send you the language? On that in a previous letter from the fall, but I can oh, can pull we, that up again. So, and so it's directly tied in. So those. I will. Okay, because that's that that's again. not what I understood in earlier uh, discussion. Again, yeah, we can clarify that for next okay. week. That's important. <laughs> Well, I would just say if that does feel like an important point because your argument is based really on the argument that it's a medical dispensary. Correct. So if it's, you know, then my question is, well, is, is your argument the same for a recreational dispensary? No. So then, I, I mean, I would just want the town. But that's not, that's, we'll discuss that further after we've heard from town council. I don't think anybody can give a complete answer on that. No, but I just want to make the point. I understand your point. I understand your point, but I, I want to cut that that's, discussion That's why I asked for that, that bro. Yeah. Yeah, I think we need to, to be fully informed. Mr. For the members who were on the board in 2014 when the B3 and B5 zoning districts were put forward for RMDs, it seems that I think there are at least a couple of you who <coughs> don't seem real comfortable with the buffer zones. I'm wondering why you didn't um, make the elimination of a buffer zone part of the vote, your recommended vote to town meeting at that time. I was on the board at that time. I don't recall the, the deliberations. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't follow it at the time, but certainly you had that opportunity. I, I don't recall. <coughs> Any other questions, concerns? Thank you. Again, I will allow for additional comment next week. If you'd like to send an email, our emails are available on the town website. So, call that for now and move on to the tent. The vote of this, the vote of this board yes. will be next week okay. as to how <coughs> this will be presented to town meeting. Okay, thank you. Can the same time, same place? They're voting on the 20th. They'll vote on the 20th. Are we in No, you're not here next week. You're over across the way. Same time, back in the second floor. Second floor, Anna. Conference. Second floor.
Article 10, uh, inserted by Janice Weaver regarding <coughs> changing the designation of a certain district. First of all, this is the first time I've done this, so I think I went beyond the amount I should have put on in the first place. Because I finally got the maps um, that show the districts that um, were changed to R2 back in the 70s, and there's about 12 different houses that the, the just got changed. For, um, because one of the neighbors had suggested that if a two-family house had gotten on fire, um, they couldn't rebuild a two-family house. But I found out since then, well, I, I just found out that that's not true. And I, the actual reason I want to do this is because this is a very dense area of Crescent Hill Avenue. This is the, the, the densest area. It's up by um, Mount Gilboa. And they've are, they already knocked down one single house and made two family out of it. And I wanted to prevent that on the rest of the street. Um, and I didn't I write any letters to the abutters. I didn't know I had to do that, so I know I have to do that now. But what I wanted to do is perhaps amend my, at town meeting if I can, amend my um, Warren article because it really only includes Crescent Hill Avenue from number two to number 41 because that's the area that's designated as R2 now. And the rest of the street's designated as R1. And it was R1 to begin with, so I don't see why it kind of go back to that. So is that possible to do? To change it, to put an amendment at town meeting? You'd have to do that at town meeting depending on how this board votes. Right, that's what, I, that's what I'm asking. Um, this is actually 19 addresses that um, I'm involved in this. I guess I guess I, I, I don't really understand what the article is asking to do and why, and why it's been chosen in just spots and blocks, and why it's not an entire neighborhood or an entire, dis an entire district based on the zoning act. Okay. What I'm saying is um, I didn't have these maps before when I made this when I made this proposal, so I do have the maps now. Okay. Okay. And so Okay. Can you back up and, and yes. tell us why you're putting this forward in your I'm putting it forward because no. I don't want the rest of the houses in the neighborhood to be knocked down and made two families because it's a dense area. And as it is now, driveways are very small. I share my driveway with next door, and they have a two family. And I just don't want that to happen in the rest of the neighborhood. And I think it's unfair to the few houses that are here to be zoned as R2 when the entire street in most of the neighborhood is R1 and was R1. And the reason it and the reason it was changed, I think, was inaccurate for it to have been changed that way. When was it changed? I, I think, like, 1975. I still haven't found it. I've been trying to find it. was, yeah. In 1975. Yeah, I was no, trying to find it. When the, the zoning changed, map changed. Right. So it's only these few houses here. And it seems like they should have stayed R1. I don't understand why. I mean, I do understand why it was proposed. I'm not mm -hmm. saying I don't understand why. But that's an inaccurate reason for it to have been changed. Because a two-family house that's standing there now burns down and can be rebuilt as a two-family. So there's no reason for the rest of the neighborhood to be our two. Okay. Kim. I'm still a little confused as far as, because uh, I just saw that map really quickly. Uh, it's uh, also up here, so this, oh. this area. So everything that's in dark yellow is is zoned as R2 right now. You want to change to R1? Yeah, I think that's the other end, isn't it? Because that's tr that's not the end. That's near Lexington. This is yes, the, it is. This is yeah. the map. And so that's Park Avenue. That's the reservoir down on the yeah. side of Bowl Street. But up to the north of that is where. Oh, yeah, we're in there. Yes. Here's okay. Bowl Street. Here's Summer. You want to go up to where Park Place is, up, the, up at the top where Mount Gilboa is, actually is. So. The mountain. Yeah, but what I'm trying to say is everything that's light, everything that's light yellow right now is uh -huh. R1, you say? This is R1. Right yes. yes. Okay, and then everything that's dark yellow right now is R2. I can show you the area I'm talking about here. It might be clearer. Because I didn't. Um, I had too much of a scope of here because I didn't realize. This section right here of Crescent Hill Avenue, all of the rest of Crescent Hill Avenue and the majority of the streets around were always R1. 
but in the 70s, for that reason I told you, it was these, this area only was changed to R2. What was the reason? The reason I was given at the time was because if a two-family house burned down, oh. then it couldn't be rebuilt as a two-family, but I mean, I just believed that because I guess I was naive. Didn't ask, but um, so what that's about, not true. I, I what about this area here? That's um, a, that's a completely different street. I know, but that's R2 too. I know, but they already have two family houses on there. That's Westminster Avenue, and they they have them there. And I don't know why there are two, but this is just my this street in this area here, all the way down Crescent Hill Avenue, is in Montague, and those are all R1 in all this area around here. So this small section, it's just a small section from West um, Moreland up to Mount Gilboa. That small section of Crescent Hill is the only one that was changed to R2. This wasn't Mount. done that way too? I don't know when that was done. I know that when this was done. That may have always been R2 because it's West Moreland and there were yeah, some and there two are two, There are two families here. There are two families here. There are a lot of two families on this part. Here, like this end of Madison, the fancy is all too big. And have you done any? No, the other end of Madison is the same. Have you done any outreach to your neighbors or? Well, I got then um, I got my neighbors' signatures in the um, immediate area, which is the majority of the people here. But I didn't get them all. But I will um, certainly send something to them. I didn't know I had to do that. I've been asking. No, no, I'm not saying yeah, you have to uh -huh. or not have to. I'm just asking. Do you have the support of your neighbors in that area here? To make that change that you that you're requesting, the, the neighbors that signed the petition. Yes, I didn't go to all of them. Okay, so one of my questions is: there's nine units, nine properties here, right? Nineteen. How'd you get that? Yeah. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, no, ten, eleven, twelve. I have the address right here. There's nineteen houses in that area, from number three to number forty-one, on both sides of the street. So out of those, the addresses, okay, so right? out of those 19, right? Okay, uh-huh. How many people have you gotten? I've only got, I only got the, um, I, I had to get the Warren article in, and that was difficult to get the wording, and I got it two days before in the pouring rain to get my signatures, so I didn't have a chance to talk to anyone, because I was trying to find out how to do it, and I never got any answers. I started this last April, so it's not so I started yesterday, but I never got any answers about how to do it, what to do, how to word it. So I couldn't get the signatures until I got the wording, and I got the wording so late, I just went out and got the signatures. And then I didn't know I had to do this other stuff until now. Will you be talking to your neighbors and asking yes. for their opinion? Oh, absolutely. And getting but, an understanding of what, what they want? Mm -hmm, uh, I will. Because I think that's very important to us. Uh, oh, I agree. Well, out of 19, the 10 of them were from that street, so. Yeah, but that's still. Oh, I know. Uh, you know, because. Uh, Essentially, what you're doing here is you're devaluing someone's house that someone's spent their life savings and buying for, and then all of a sudden, just by rezoning, you devalued it. By making R1? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I think it's a much better value at R1. It's too dense for R2. It's the densest area of the neighborhood. I would disagree on that part because where you can have one family living on a piece of property and we have two families living on a piece of property. The value is more if there's two families living there, okay? And that's just what I believe in, okay? So I'm just really concerned I'm just, that what you're doing is essentially devaluing everybody's property that, that already had bought the house. As a single. As a two family, it's zone two family has a two family in there. No, when they bought it, it wasn't zoned as a two family. There wasn't zoning back then when they did it because it got changed to, to an R2 after the houses were built. It wasn't. It no, no, how was, no, the houses were built? Pardon me? If I bought this house in 85. Right. Okay, it was a two family. Mm -hmm. Okay, it has a certain value to it. I paid that value for it. Then all of a sudden you come back and change that to a single family, it's no longer worth that much anymore. You just all of a sudden devalue my property. I'm not changing the houses to a, to um, not be a two family anymore. I'm just changing the zoning so that the um, a single family house can't get knocked down and be made a two family. That's what I'm doing. This area was an R1. Even the two families that were there, the whole area was an R1 when I bought my house. 
It was an R1 when my parents bought the house. It was an R1 before. I don't even know when okay, Zoe started. Let me, let me, I'll, I'll just say one okay. more thing, and I'll let the rest of the board talk. Because I think I'm. Mm -hmm. When you, you, you're saying this is a very dense area. Of the street, that's the densest area of that entire street that goes down to the Lexington line. So doesn't the zoning setbacks, parking requirements, and all the other stuff that's already there would uh, prevent a single family being put into a two-family, or it, that's not enough? Uh, that's a question. I'm not, you know. It's already been done. Great idea. They've already done that to our house. But you just told me it's a very dense area that they... Uh, it is. And I don't want the rest of it to be more dense than it is now, is what I'm trying to say. I don't know why that small area should be designated as an R2 when it was an R1 all, the, all before 75. All right, well, um, I'm going to... Go ahead, David. Uh, I have just a, a more general thought, uh, which is, uh, you know, we do have a zoning recodification process underway now, and uh, at some point uh, in the future, uh, we will be looking at um, the existing zoning districts and uh, whether uh, there should be uh, changes to those or consolidation of some districts. Um, uh, to uh, be more consistent with um, with uh, contemporary uh, understandings of zoning as opposed to 1975. Um, so um, I'm a little bit hesitant to dig into something this specific when I know that um, sometime in the future, maybe not this year, maybe, uh, but so relatively soon we are going to be looking at this issue town-wide. Um, and then you would have an opportunity to, to make your case for this at, at that time as part of the overall process. Wait a while again. Sorry, sir? No, I'll, I'll wait till my turn. <laughs> yeah, I understand what you're saying, but I'm just afraid that it will be too late for a couple of houses that are potentially, well, one, into one specifically to get knocked down and made into another two family. And that's what I was trying to prevent. But I understand what you're saying. And for the most part, I would have to say that the majority of the houses that are single are going to stay single for quite a while. So probably would prevent all but one, you know, being changed. So I understand what you're saying. But I could wait, and perhaps <coughs> it could be, you know, rezoned to the house. Is the owner of the house that you're talking about here? Have you gotten there? The house that the house that you in? speculate might. Be knocked no, down. They're, they're all I, mean, I, 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 Janice, I appreciate the time mm -hmm. and the effort that you put into it, but I can't support an article based on, on, on that reasoning mm -hmm. that you don't want. You have some speculative house in mind that might be, might be torn down. Well, just it's because, next door to the one they just did. No, 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 no I know. I, I believe yeah. me. I, I live in the neighborhood. I know. I know your street well. My kids trick or treat on it, um, but it's, it's. That's, that's not a good enough reason for me to support this mm -hmm. kind of change, is particularly with the reason that, that David has stated with a, a holistic review of all the, the residential and business. Well, now I understand that. And so I understand that that's makes coming sense. down. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely appreciate you wanting to, to keep the, the character of that street the way it's been for the last four years, but it's also been 42 years since it's been in R2. Um, so it's, I'm not saying Keep it the same. I'm not saying change it, but I'm saying that I can't support this particular article. Mm -hmm. I understand that. And I'm, um, Mr. Watson, I was just, um, would, it, would it be possible when you do the recodification of the zoning that this could then come about that the whole street would be perhaps changed when I want? I mean, is that a possibility when you look at it? Well, I think at, at the point when that happens, We'll be looking at all the zones town wide. Okay. Yeah, it, that that'll be a process, like the, yeah. like the master planning mm -hmm. process, like the, uh, right. the lead into change the substance. So, so not not during the current zoning. Not now. Right. Not now. Next not year. Now. Yeah. Not now. Okay. So I could talk to my neighbors more about that then. I, I think that I think that'd be good. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, I didn't really know the process. No. So Be before you leave, you. I mean. 
two other members of the board have to weigh in oh. and take public comment. But I, I, I would leave it what, what's been discussed, except if this has been around for a year, then Jenny and Laura, are you aware of what's going on with this? We haven't heard much about it. With what? This, with this, this issue is suddenly coming up. Mm, we heard about it when it got filed. It was new to us. Um, Janice, as we mentioned well, earlier, is a member yeah. of the residential study group, and it was new to all of the okay. members of the residential then, study then group. Then let, well. let me stick with what's been said about it. That I just think it would be better if it was maybe a great idea, but if it was in the context of the residential zoning study group or whatever it is, giving a recommendation well, I relative to the whole thing. I might want to hear uh, Jenny as director of the planning department your opinion on it and what, what, how it should be how it should be handled. And it may be more than look at it maybe it may be yeah. differently placed. There's there's any number of options that we'll okay. take a look at. Okay. Glad to answer that one if you want to keep going. Gene. How many two family houses are there on in the that house? section? In that section um, how many? Single family. Well, now five. So out of 19, um, would be 14, I believe, a single. 14 single and five. On to the, the, this the, area. Not, the, not what's encompassed in the Warren article because I made the scope bigger than I had to. But in the area you want rezoned? Yes, the area I want rezoned is um, one on each side of me, two across the street, and the one they just tore down. So five. Yeah. And can you explain in a little more detail why you don't like the two family? houses as compared to the one family house? No, I don't dislike the two family houses. Mm -hmm. I just think that now because they're knocking everything down now and building up two family houses with singles, I don't like to see that. And this particular house is fine. It looks nice. I'm not saying I don't like it. It's just that the area is, con is um, condensed. It's the smallest area on that street. And I think that would be more traffic, more of everything, and the houses I don't know, maybe the character of the houses I liked better when it was the way it was. That's all. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Don't leave us yet. We okay. have other questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's a public comment now. Uh, it's open. It's my word. John? Uh, I, I have a similar sentiment with uh, Janice as far as keeping some of the integrity of the neighborhood, et cetera. One idea might be, and it might be easier than rezoning it, might be to get it into a historic district. It is. But I don't think, like the one John Carney did, that wasn't in the historic district. Well, it was I just one over. Was. Yeah, it's it was. Six houses away. That, that's what I'm saying. That yeah. might be an easier remedy to keep the visual but That's integrity. spotty historic. I don't know how they did that, because that house is older than the one next door to it. Yeah. But uh, I, would I don't suggest know what they that did. Might be easier. That that would be a conversation that we have. Mm -hmm. Other comments, questions, Mr. Ward. Yeah, yeah. John Ward and Jason Street. Um, as I think the only person in this room who was here in 1975 when the zoning, present zoning bylaw was put together, uh, I can uh, tell you that the there wasn't GIS, there wasn't a vast amount of research. The lines, the lines were drawn in a kind of arbitrary fashion, and would, would often without a lot of consideration because they hadn't rezoned the town in a, in a comprehensive way for like, I don't know how many years before that. Um, so it's, it's not, um, and, and I'm, I'm sure uh, Ms. Schwieber and, and her neighbors were not told that they were going to be put into a two-family zone when they had been single, single family zone as long as anybody can remember and, and before that. Uh, so, um, I, I wouldn't uh, rely upon uh, that uh, decision by town meeting, which was passing a whole zoning bylaw over the course of one or two evenings, uh, and there was a lot of horse trading and so on, and nobody traded this one out of the R2 zone. Um, if you want to see why, and I, I actually I disagree with the proponent in the, about the attractiveness of the house that went in there. It's, it's a fit house, um, basically. Um, the um, folks familiar with Beacon Street, north of Broadway? I mean, 
that is why you don't want a street to be two family zone. All the everything that was there was torn down and all those row of pit houses were stuck in there. Now now the, 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 now the horse having left the barn we're trying to close the door. Uh, so let's not let's close the door before the horse leaves uh, uh, leaves the barn up in Crescent Hill Avenue and, and uh, so on. Uh, as far as getting into a historic district, uh, yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, when the historic district lines were drawn, again, whenever you draw a line, somebody's going to be unhappy. Um, and uh, I was not personally involved in how those lines were drawn. It's, it's a very irregular shaped district. It was mostly drawn upon probably consent of the respective homeowners. And if somebody was suspicious, this was a, quite a few years ago, People were then suspicious of historic because they didn't realize what it did for neighborhood preservation. Um, uh, you know, a, 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 a small price to pay to, to know that you can't put one of those things next door. Um, but it's a long process. There has to be a, a study, and it goes to the, uh, the uh, Mass Historical Commission and, and, and so on, and it, it um, and then, like any, then once it gets for a town meeting, um, and it, it gets passed, and as you know, like just like zoning, it has to go to the attorney general who sits on it for as long as possible, and then they send it back, and it has to be advertised. So it's not a, uh, it, it's not a very quick and ready solution uh, for for the situation there. Though I think it is not inappropriate, and I think if the people uh, came into the, the district commission and asked. That, that their neighborhood be included, I, I think the district commission would look on it favorably. In fact, we did discuss this, it's, uh, as I say, unfortunately beyond our boundaries, uh, or this, this one wouldn't have happened, uh, but um, we're certainly uh, uh, in, in sympathy with the idea that, that this, uh, this part of the neighborhood, which is really part, part of the general area of the Monkeyville Historic District, should be kind of kept the way it is, and, and uh, uh, so to the extent we can, we, we, we would support the, the, the article as, as proposed. And I think to say, oh, let's think about it in recodification, let's think about a historic district, let's do something, as long as it's off in the future sometime. That's not the solution. The, the problem, the developers are now. They're not, they're not going to wait for, if we had a moratorium for three years, say, fine, all right, let's have a moratorium. And, 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 we'll, and then we can work everything out so everybody's happy. But that's not gonna happen. They're gonna be at the building inspector's office. They could be there tomorrow morning with a plan to tear this house down and put up one of those pit houses. So, so let's, let, let's, give, let's give, give, give this article a chance. One, yes, zoning recodification is happening, is happening for a reason. It's supported in terms of how it's been happening. We have hired a consultant who is helping with the rewrite of the zoning bylaw. We've said all along that the intention is for part two of it to address some of the policy and broader substantive issues that we've been discussing. Um, I think with this particular one, what my concern is, is I don't, hear from you any type of community or neighborhood discussion having happened at all. Um, and I think that with any anything that would be proposed in any future um, or currently, there should be neighborhood discussion. It should not be limited to the people who filed the article. And I think that after having a community or neighborhood discussion where you get broader based input, especially where you might be impacting things with people's homes, um, I think that then you talk about what are the options. So we're brainstorming options here, but I don't think that that is necessarily appropriate. I think that more appropriate would be at the community or neighborhood level for people to understand and weigh those different options. So for example, we've talked about the zoning change, obviously. Uh, we've talked about design issues. We've talked about adding it to the historic district. Those are things that people in your neighborhood more broadly or in these areas should have the opportunity to weigh and consider 
before putting forth an article. Then I think I might mm -hmm. I might see it differently, but I'm not hearing it that way unless well, unless I miss something. No, the only thing is I didn't. That was never done before when it got changed. It was. Well, never I'm not just, talking about 1970. No, I know, but I'm just saying. So I didn't realize to, to do that. To but, and I understand, but you. But you now I do, so I would definitely. So in the future, if mm -hmm. this were to happen as a conversation in the future, that is the way that I would recommend something would right. occur in the future and that you would, you know, the notification process is actually very specific. Um, and we did talk to Janice about that um, previously, so she's aware of that. Um, yeah. But I, but that's that's just notification. I'm talking about a broader, an actual dialogue where you have the opportunity to understand the different um, possibilities. Right. So it's not that I'm, it's not a for or against. No, it's I just understand allowing what you're people saying. to get. I'm glad to get, get, no, I am. I'm glad to get the yeah. input because I didn't really understand it before as much. Thank you very much. Any, any other comments, questions? Yeah, two minutes to start. Okay. Just um, a couple things. One, there are very specific requirements for notification. I, I think it's for the public hearing if you're changing someone's zoning district. Mm -hmm. you know, frankly, I'm surprised none of the property owners of the affected properties are here. Have, has the town made a determination whether those requirements have been satisfied or even can be satisfied at this point? Um, the, the, the zoning bylaws does say that it, you're supposed to notify the abutters before the, um, when, when you file. It's, you have to put, you're supposed to have proof that you have notified the abutters when you file. Um, Janice didn't do that. No one told her she needed to do that. So we've been discussing allowing her to do that. Is it I mean, a I feel like thing or, a, or a state law? It's, it's not in the state law, interestingly. It's in, it's in our zone. Sure? Well, I looked in our zone. It's not but, part of Section 5. Not exactly written that way. And it's related to a map change specifically. No. So if you're changing the map. Which but that's what, what you're doing. And that, that's what would be happening here, exactly. Which means, yeah. Uh, but irrespective of that, I guess I, I would say, um, you know, I, do, I think this does bring up a larger question of what's going to happen during the modification. And I'm not very familiar with that area. I'm presuming that most of the lots are undersized, like they are in the, much of the town. And I think one of the things that recodification really has to take more seriously is the whole issue of existing nonconformities. Because uh, in what I've looked through in what was been written up so far, it didn't seem like it was going to be a very large focus of the effort. We'll talk about that. But yeah, that's, that's, that's for comes. future. But, um, thank you. but anyway, you know, that's all I have to say. Thank you. What else? I just make a very brief comment that I, I would appreciate a real sense of urgency about this because the property that we were all talking about, which was at 9 and 11 Crescent Hill Avenue, was a extremely appropriate, lovely cottage, which was demolished. It was on an undersized lot. I think it was a 5,800 square foot lot. And somehow or another did not trigger the special process, uh, a special permit process. Uh, so it was demolished, and one of the you know very very generic duplexes uh, was built there. So I I think that what we're seeing is that things somehow or another are slipping through the cracks, and in an area like this where you do have some historic context and you do still have a fairly coherent street, and you are so close to the historic district, I really there I think there should be a real sense of urgency because because Mr. Warden is absolutely right. The developers, they know, you know, they know. They know this is their business. This is what they do for a living, and they know what's coming up. Um, and these houses should be protected. This neighborhood should be protected. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take further public comment on that uh, next week. At this point, I have a motion to continue each public hearing to uh, yeah. next week. Our motion to continue articles 6 through 10 to next week is uh, the 20th. The 20th. 20th. March 20th. March 20th. At 7.30. The 7.30. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Chairman, can I just um, clarify the procedural the, the hearing is open until next week. You'll be taking comments in between by inviting. Yeah, I, take, I will take written comments. In between, um, I will I, take additional. I want to thank the board for posting their whole packets on the website. And could I ask that for next week's um, meeting, that all of the comments that you haven't already 
put into the packet for this week, get put into next week's packet, so people can see them before they hear it. Yes. Some of them we just received yeah, this time. I understand. Yeah, just whatever they time, but for the information. Thank you. And everything has been going on. Yeah, I think that I really appreciate it. Yeah, actually, staff deserves accommodation for their efforts to put everything online and make it even more accessible. And I will say also, with that data, we're going to get on Nova's agenda quick, more quickly than I realized. So that'll be good positive. Can I uh, put a motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.